Chapter 1776 to 1800. Supremacy Games. 1776 Severed Communications. Chaos and order laws are extremely powerful. Thor mentioned, till now, I still believe that Eris hasn't shown her full strength. So, if you are going to aim for her, you need to be prepared like no other time. Felix's initial plan was to aim for the Stone of Reality and leave the tower immediately after obtaining it. However, if he sought after Eris' core, he had to change his plans. There was a huge difference between fighting Unigens and seeking to harvest their cores. Eris alone would go all out, making sure to foil his attempts. With Uranus at her side, it would be harder than ever, especially, when his options got limited after Asna's core started the devouring process. Eris is too shrewd. Lady Sphinx added with a solemn tone, if I was in her place, I would have predicted your next move to be gunning after the Stone of Reality. Thus, they will be also prepared for your arrival. If it was someone else, they would have assumed that Felix would use Demeter's core as a price to escape the tower, but, Eris wasn't any random person. She would predict Felix using Demeter's core as a price to get himself teleported straight to the first floor. This was exactly what Felix planned on doing initially. He didn't even bother to consider wishing to obtain the Stone of Reality straight away. He was certain it wouldn't work. Lilith had told him that the three rulers planned to sacrifice whatever celestial energy was required as a price to obtain the Stone of Reality. Unfortunately, they were forced to scrap the idea after the universe didn't respond to Lilith's calls. This meant the wish could not be fulfilled regardless of the price, just like wishing for the death of the three rulers, the Unigens, and such far-fetched wishes. Indeed, this changes everything. Felix nodded calmly, I can't focus on the stone of reality if I seek Eris' core, I have to deal with them first. How do you suggest doing that? Candace wondered, if you devoured one core, you will be left susceptible to attacks from the other. Will you try to devour both their cores simultaneously like you did with Zeus and Poseidon? It's doubtful if it will work against them. Felix shook his head. Eris and Uranus weren't the same as Zeus and Poseidon, in both strength and intelligence. But, most importantly, Felix wasn't in his dream realm, where he could act as a god in it. In fact, he might get caught in her dimensional prisons if he got too close to Eris. This time, she wouldn't allow him to escape no matter what. That's just Eris, how could he bring even Uranus near Asna's core too, and commence the process? This was without mentioning that both Unigens wouldn't hesitate to abuse their laws to the limit the moment they felt an ounce of danger for their lives. All past Unigens slain under Felix were taken down before they could manage to still their will and abuse their laws. If Asna's core had already kicked off its devouring process, then, it wouldn't matter anymore. Only Demeter was brave and had the necessary will to abuse her laws to take down Felix, while she failed, she was very close to saving herself. On the other hand, Uranus was done screwing around. He had already planned on using matter execution the instant he faced Felix regardless of the price he had to pay. Felix knew this, so he had to act very, very smart about his next move. The only way forward is to fight them separately. Felix held his chin thoughtfully, but, how am I supposed to separate them? You probably don't need to. Lady Sphinx mentioned, I believe they will separate themselves to camp on the first level and the twentieth floor. Hmm? Makes sense. Felix nodded in realization. While Eris was capable of predicting his next move, she wouldn't commit to it 100%. It was foolish to leave the 20th floor unguarded when it was considered a free ticket for the Unigens to abuse their laws. Thus, one of them had to remain there. Will it make any difference? Candace tilted her head in confusion, I believe they will be able to support each other almost instantly with their kind of abilities. While Candace wasn't too knowledgeable about the full range of Eris' abilities, she had enough common sense to assume such a possibility. True, they wouldn't separate unless they had countermeasures to assist each other in an instant. Felix said coldly, but, I have my powers now. I can come up with something to deal with it. 
Felix managed to survive a chase from three Unigens and even take one down while his strength was sealed by 99%. He pulled it off without using a single Sin Law based ability. With his unique seven Sin Law symbols and Sin Symbolic techniques back, anything was possible, especially, in the quantum realm. Noticing his confidence, Candace couldn't help but ask with an eager tone, What do you have in mind? Nothing for now, it's yet too fuzzy. Felix coughed. Candace was left speechless at his empty confidence. There is no need to rush. Lady Sphinx advised, with your abilities returned, you can create more sin symbolic techniques fit for your battle. I was planning to. Felix nodded, my contemplating wisp has come up with some brilliant new sin symbolic techniques that require Zeus and Poseidon's laws. His wisp was awake for 12 million years and Felix wasn't stupid to waste this kind of time on mindless meditation. He put him on duty to come up with new symbols and sin symbolic techniques, knowing that he had barely scratched the surface. With the new laws involved, it opened a new vault of techniques, techniques that no one could prepare against. But first, how much time has gone by in the matter universe? Felix asked with a solemn tone. If too much time had passed, he wouldn't feel comfortable with taking his sweet time training, his thought would be consumed with the thought of a sna waking up at any moment. Close to a millennia has gone by in the matter universe. Lady Sphinx answered. A millennia? So, a close ratio of an hour to a year. Felix mumbled, it's not so bad, a sna shouldn't be up. With the heavy backlash, a sna went through after breaking her seal. A millennia of recovery was nothing unless the three rulers intervened. Her core being at the furthest possible distance made it even harder to recover faster, especially, when she would be locked up in the dimensional pocket next to the universe's heart. Why don't you establish a connection with her right now? Candace wondered in confusion, your abilities have been restored. I doubt distance is the issue. You think I haven't thought it? Distance isn't an issue but the tower is. Felix shook his head, I can't even feel my mark inside her dream world, making it impossible to communicate with it. Indeed, it must be it. Lady Sphinx nodded in support, the tower cuts off all sorts of communication with the outside world. It would have been different if I had my wisp in her dream world, but alas. Felix sighed bitterly. Communication between wisps inside and outside the tower was only possible because the person could freely switch focus between their main consciousness and wisp. In this case, Felix had a mark, a brand, in a SNES dream world, and the only way to activate it was by leaving the tower's domain. This meant Felix could reach out to a SNES any moment he desired as long as he decided to use Demeter's core to leave the tower. While he missed her dearly and wanted nothing more but to hold her in his embrace again, he knew it wasn't the right time. Especially when he knew it wouldn't save Asna completely, after all, the mark was nothing but a mere attempt to establish communication through her dream world. 1777 The moment of truth is nigh. While Felix started experimenting with the new symbols and sin symbolic techniques theories, the news about the chase had already reached the Eternal Kingdom. Right now, in the heart of Artemis' domain, where a spectrum of ancient forests and rich undergrowth Artemis was hosting Athena and Aeolus. They were settled around a table within a lush peaceful jungle, Artemis poured a creamy, amber nectar into carved wooden cups, handing them out. Athena raised her cup in a silent toast, her eyes thoughtful. Both the quantum realm and the eternal kingdom have seen upheaval unlike any before. Demeter's fall is a loss that will be felt deeply. Aeolus nodded, stirring the drink in his cup, watching the liquid spin like the wines he commanded. I still can't believe it, not only did they fail to catch him, but they ended up losing Demeter for good and even gave him the chance to break his celestial chains. It's unsettling. He has regained his full strength and who knows what his next move will be. Athena leaned forward, her gaze sharp and calculated, it took me by surprise too. I didn't expect this from Eris and Uranus. Such a setback, it's bound to bite them later in the ass. Ah, I feel like we are dropping by like flies. Artemis smiled bitterly, not even Lilith has put us through this much terror. 
I also never thought a mortal would make Lilith seem like a nicer paragon. Aeolus gazed at his peers and the infinite sky above them, it's just us left. It feels too eerie, I don't know why, but I am starting to believe that Eris and Uranus will be next to die. Then, it will be us. How could Aeolus not feel a bit anxious about their future? Felix had proved to be unstoppable even while chained up by the universe. He had already cleared up the kingdom of most Unigens and he felt that when he returned here, he wouldn't show them mercy. Whether they sit this one out or not, if he ever came to attack the Eternal Kingdom, they would be forced to defend it with the three rulers again unless they decided to exile themselves. Honestly, if he managed to deal with Eris and Uranus, I won't wait for him to return. Artemis said softly, I will exile myself and live in isolation somewhere random in the universe until this war ends. You guys are being too pessimistic. Athena remarked with a serious tone, there is still Ares, who has yet to make his move. I am sure that the three rulers must have contacted him and told him to be more active. The moment Ares' name was brought up, Aratimis and Aeolus' concerns seemed to die out in relief, their reaction was understandable. If Felix was the boogeyman, then Ares, was the hitman sent to kill him, he was that terrifying and powerful. But, even if he wanted to join the fun, it's too late now. Aeolus frowned, they are in the tower and I doubt he can access it. His laws might be too wicked, but the tower's authority is absolute. True, but still, this is Ares. Athena narrowed her eyes, if he wanted, I am certain he will find a way. Speaking of Boogeyman's assassin, Ares could be seen still sitting in a meditation posture amidst a colorful nothingness in the realm of infinity and finality. The realm where all matter starts and ends. A realm where life slash matter could not fundamentally exist. A realm where even Unigens could not step inside without getting disintegrated and joining the colorful mess. The third level and the bottom level of the quantum realm. Yet, Ares was chilling in it like he was in his home. What an interesting little lad, I thought Eris was enough to deal with him in his current weakened state. I guess I have underestimated him plenty. Ares chuckled to himself, his eyes reflecting peculiar scenes occurring within the tower. It was like he was watching a live stream, this was simply impossible on so many levels when considering that the tower was a sealed shut edifice. So be it, this will make it more worthwhile. Ares closed his eyes again and returned to his isolation. While Athena believed that the three rulers must have contacted Ares and pressured him to make his move, in reality, they left him to his own devices. They knew Ares would never gang up on a target regardless of his power or danger. In other words, he planned to wait until either side won. As for fearing Felix growing stronger than ever after wiping out Ares and Uranus, such a thought never bothered him. In fact, as the god of war, he welcomed it with open arms. Meanwhile, back on the twentieth floor, Uranus was sitting at the highest point of the clockwork tower. His hair was fluttering by the wind as he leaned his head against his divine bronze scythe, gazing into the distance with an unconcerned expression. Twelve million years should have already passed more or less in the void. He thought, now, it's the moment of the truth. Will he appear on the first floor as predicted by Eris or will he run away? Uranus wasn't too pleased with this development. He was left behind to guard the twentieth floor while Eris was sent to camp on the first floor. She was chosen because he refused to come close to the stone of reality ever again after he almost lost his life in their previous attempt. It worked out in their favor too due to the environment on the first floor being more fit for Eris. However, None of this preparation would matter if Felix determined to leave the tower altogether. Since there was no way for them to find out whether Felix determined to stay or leave, all they could do was wait patiently for his next move. This was a horrible plan, but he couldn't complain as they had already lost many great chances to end Felix once and for all. Have some faith, he will show up, sooner or later. Eris pacified his irritation through a wisp she planted in his mind. Faith. I hate being in the passive role. Uranus growled. If he decides to leave the tower, I have put one of my clones near the rift location. Eris added, 
if he shows up for Apollo's sake, we would know. While this wasn't perfect, it did make Uranus feel somewhat relieved. What he feared the most was Felix leaving the tower while they stayed waiting for him forever akin to idiots. If he shows up, just remember, this is it, there won't be any more chances. Eris alerted calmly, either we win or we die, there is no other alternative. Die. The universe's heart will break open alone before I drop dead. Uranus sneered coldly, the moment the F asterisker appears before me, I will erase him off the face of the universe. We will see about that. Eris closed her eyes and switched her focus back to her main consciousness. The moment she opened her eyes, she glanced above her and murmured, the moment of truth is nigh. As she was closing her eyelids, a fading reflection was caught on her pupil, a reflection of a massive grey stone in the shape of a heart. Ka thumb. Ka thumb. Ka thumb. With each powerful and thunderous heartbeat, cracks appeared on it, releasing a peculiar misty miasma. Eris seemed to distance herself from that miasma at all costs, why? Only those who stepped into the first floor knew. 1778 Challenging the Universe's Authority Many years later. In a void, where the absence of light prevailed, Felix was seen surrounded by close to a hundred symbols and symbolic techniques, creating a colorful show in this desolate graveyard. Suddenly, he snapped his eyes open, and the symbols disappeared at once, reflecting at the back of his demonic crimson eyes. It's time. He declared calmly as he stood up slowly. The tenants all shared solemn expressions as they observed him stretch his limbs. None of them questioned his readiness or doubted his chances to win. They had followed his preparation journey from A to Z and knew that he left no stone unturned. If it was up to them, they would undoubtedly proclaim that the current Felix was at his strongest form if physical strength wasn't taken into consideration due to the quantum realm. Give them hell. Thor gave him a head nod in approval. You know it. With a cold smile, Felix summoned out the green dragonic tail with the head of a fox and wished out loud for all to hear, I wish to be conveyed directly to the twentieth floor, the clockwork tower. The moment the equal trade symbol was invoked, it manifested before him in all of its glory and terrifying appetite for sacrifices. I offer the core of Demeter as the price for this passage. He declared. The equal trade symbol flickered its edges blurring as it processed the gravity of the transaction. The fabric of reality itself seemed to hold its breath as the symbol considered such an insane price. I can't believe he really went for it, a core, a unigen core will be sacrificed, crazy. Lord Loki mumbled in shock, not expecting Felix's lack of hesitation. While unigens couldn't really be killed since the universe's heart could create new cores after a period, still, it didn't take away from the craziness of the situation. The kid has really come a long way, from being stingy with supremacy coins to sacrificing Unigen's cores. Hormongondra chuckled, reminiscing on the old good times, as he watched the symbol accepting the payment. It glowed brighter, its light intensifying to a blinding radiance as it began to break the core apart and devour its energy. Cling! 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 The twenty-eight celestial chains materialized around the core, rattling noisily, but the fox couldn't care less. It opened its mouth wide and devoured the core with its chains. There goes an ascension. Felix chuckled in derision. He might not have hesitated, but it didn't mean that the decision hadn't done damage to him. Sacrificing one for two isn't too bad either. He narrowed his eyes as he prepared himself to get teleported and commence his assault. However, just as the universe was about to fulfill his wish, the echoing tower intervened. From the very depths, the stone of reality summoned its own energy, creating a counterforce against Felix's wish, generating a defensive barrier of temporal and spatial distortions designed to deny Felix's departure. It was like the tower refused to accept the universe's intervention in its iron-clad rules and authority within its domain. But, the universe's word was final and must not be challenged. This created a clash of these two colossal primordial forces, rupturing the stability of the surrounding void. Stunned and a bit scared, 
Felix kept gazing around him with widened eyes at the emerging cracks in space-time, creating a spider web around him. What the f asterisk ck? What the f asterisk ck? The tower can go against the universe's authority even while it is being active. Felix and the tenants were already having trouble accepting the stone of reality sharing an equal authority to the universe while it was dormant. To see the universe failing to reinforce its authority actively was a different kind of insanity. This was like a hyena being equal in strength to a slumbering lion. Realistically, the moment it woke up, the hyena should have absolutely no chance against it. The scene before them told a different story. Crack. 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 The very core of the void threatened to shatter like glass under the strain of these conflicting cosmic authorities. Felix, caught in the epicenter of this cataclysmic battle, shielded himself with barriers while moving all over the place, attempting to avoid the shards of reality. Holy SHT, holy SHT, did I get scammed out of a core? Don't tell me I am going to die like this. Scared SH asterisk plus, Felix kept moving all over the place, knowing that the moment he got caught in a spatial crack, it would be game over for him. He had no idea where he would get thrown and he didn't want to find out. Fortunately, it didn't seem like the universe had taken this kind of disrespect lightly. With a deafening roar that echoed through the void, the true universal forces intervened, tipping the balance in favor of the transaction. The equal trade symbol, now fully doused with the power of Demeter's core, outshone the resistance mounted by the echoing tower. Before Felix or the tenants could react, he felt a sudden familiar shift, making him realize that the symbol was about to grant his wish. Thus, although this situation challenged the very concept of the universe being the ultimate authority, Felix threw everything at the back of his mind and focused on his main goal. With a cold focused gaze, Felix vanished from his original position, conveyed directly into the heart of the 20th floor, the clockwork tower. He emerged at the center of the grand entrance, surrounded by walls adorned with intricate gears and swaying pendulums. Without wasting a single nanosecond or bothering to look for his enemies, he brought forth the equal trade symbol and made another wish, I wish for the clockwork tower, to be locked against any and all forms of spatial teleportation and manipulation. The price used for the wish? It was none other than the void creatures born under the leadership of Nimo and the void nation in the past millennia. As Felix was never alone in his struggles. Right this moment, in the boundless expanse of the Void Realm, Nimmo and the Void Nation had their eyes captured by an unexpected phenomenon. The new army of Void creatures started to radiate with an unnatural green light and then broke apart, dissolving into streams of green particles. As the light intensified, it turned into a mirroring equal trade symbol, floating ominously above them. The fox started devouring the void creatures akin to a hungry hippo under everyone's stunned eyes. Instinctively, they dropped to their knees, their faces lifted in awe and reverence. They knew that Nimmo would never use Felix's resources for a wish, which meant, this was the doing of their god. Thus, a wave of recognition and devotion swept through the crowd as they started cheering zealously. For the Paragon, our god. For the Paragon, our God. 4. The Paragon, Our God. As the cheers echoed around him, a smile broke on Nimmo's youthful face. He no longer was a child, becoming a fine young adult, who was almost identical to his father, if the raccoon ears and the tail weren't taken into consideration. Father, the only news we get is from Aunt Candace, but I can already tell that you are kicking ass down there. He uttered his heart filled with pride at the notion of aiding his father in his quest to save his mother. Suddenly, Arthur came from nowhere and bowed his head, My prince, it seems like our lord has restored his powers, this means he will require more and more void creatures. At this pace, we might run out before him. That's unacceptable. Nimmo's tone turned sinister, Make more void creatures, I don't care if you consume galaxies to make it happen, just do it. That's what I wanted to hear. Arthur took off with a pleased cold look. 1779 2 seconds. Unlike Felix, 
Nimmo had absolutely no connection to the universe or the races living in it. All he cared about was his father's and mother's safety. They were his entire world ever since he was born and if he had to sacrifice the entire universe to help them achieve their agendas, so be it. As for empathy, mercy and such good-natured emotions? He had none for the strangers, for he was a miniature version of the Paragon of Sins. Candace, who was always by Nimmo's side, heard his cold-blooded order and tried to intervene, knowing that it would not sit right with Felix's soul. Nim. Auntie, don't bother. Nimmo replied indifferently. I am just trying to tell you that you should target deserted galaxies or at least places outside of the Scallions' territory. Candace sighed, I also couldn't care less about their lives, but the Alliance is our Lord's legacy. If we invaded and started slaughtering them, it would undo all the work he has done. Nimmo went silent for a moment, realizing that she was right. While he couldn't understand his father's care for those mortals, he would never do anything to taint his legacy. Fine, tell them to target deserted galaxies. There is plenty to farm in them. He ordered while gazing at the symbol still hard at work. Good call. Candace smiled and went to deliver the new order. Unlike Nimmo, she understood that while Felix's heart could be said to have turned cold and uncaring about mortals, he would still not strike them down just because. It was for a simple reason, he had never forgotten his origins. Back to Clockwork Tower, Felix's wish had worked even though the time difference was too big between the realms. It was normal when considering that the judge was the universe and time would not put a limitation on it. The wish had made the tower to be on total lockdown from any spatial-related abilities or techniques, regardless of their nature. In other words, even if Eris tried to use her chaos voodoo magic to get in here, she would fail hard. It was only logical since Koa's laws tapped on other laws to achieve her agendas instead of creating answers out of thin air. Even in chaos, there was order and logic. Unbeknownst to this, Uranus' face contorted with a mixture of shock and anger the moment Felix had entered the floor. He had waited many years in the same spot after Felix completed the 12 million years of punishment. This made him start to doubt whether Felix would even show up and that he must be somewhere in the quantum realm, laughing at them. Thus, when he appeared, he couldn't help but feel like he was dreaming. However, Felix brought him back to reality after pulling off the spatial lockdown wish making him understand that he was the real deal. Paragon. Uranus bellowed, his voice reverberating hatefully from the top of the tower. He kept his word to Eris and wasted absolutely no time in his attack. He raised his hand, palm facing toward Felix, and then hissed through his clenched teeth matter execution. With a forceful thrust of his arm, Uranus directed the invisible vibrational waves towards Felix. The attack moved with brutal speed, a silent deadly force, racing across the distance between them. It was an unforgiving strike, intended to disintegrate Felix instantly, leaving nothing but a void where he once stood. Yet, Felix neither moved nor bothered to conjure up a barrier. He remained standing in his place with one hand resting on his neck, eating the attack directly with a nonchalant expression. Upon contact, the anticipated disintegration at the string-based level hadn't occurred. Instead, a mere wave of wind washed over Felix, fluttering his wavy long crimson hair for a moment before resting back in its place. Under Uranus' stunned expression, Felix remarked indifferently, I only have two seconds of immunities against your laws, but it's more than enough for the likes of you. Before Uranus could react, Felix invoked the wrathful separation symbol and separated himself into seven entities, each with a different hair and eye color. All of them had the seven dragonic tails summoned up behind them. He wasn't done, all seven clones activated a new sin symbolic technique called, Prideful Storm Surge. A technique that encapsulated the essence of gluttony by consuming energy from its surroundings, and turning it into electrical quantum based energy. When it came to energies, gluttony law was at the very top, and not even quantum energy would elude it. Pride by feeding off Felix's self-belief to be the fastest being around, and lastly, the ferocious speed of and striking power of lightning. 
This technique elevated Felix's speed to unparalleled levels but also imbued him with an overwhelming sense of superiority and an insatiable desire to outpace all others, literally and metaphorically consuming any competition around him. Without hesitation, all seven Felixes charged at Uranus, their bodies engulfed in wild electricity. Since each had a different color scheme, the electrical discharges matched it and made them resemble a rainbow arc as they landed right next to Uranus. It's time to pay your debt. One of the clones uttered coldly as Hyun leashed another technique called Wrathful Lightning Storm. He summoned a fierce tempest of crimson lightning that crackled violently towards Uranus. Simultaneously, another clone invoked Pride's arcs generating spectacular golden arcs of electricity that crowned their heads. These arcs lashed out like royal scepters, seeking to not only strike Uranus but also to impose psychological dominance. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! As Uranus countered these assaults with waves of his own vibrational energy, trying to break the attacks back to their quantum energy and create openings for counter-strikes, the third clone employed Gluttony's swallowing whirl. Whoosh! Whoosh! This clone spun at the center of the fray, creating a vortex that attempted to suck in anything nearby. The whirl was ferocious, growing in intensity with each second, drawing in debris, energy and any stray attacks, using them to fuel its own destructive power. Uranus grunted under the weight of the relentless attacks. He parried a lightning bolt, deflected a golden arc, ate a flaming fist, and narrowly escaped the pull of the swallowing whirl. There was a literal myriad of elemental attacks assaulting like there was no tomorrow, making it extremely difficult to predict their next moves. While the scene was chaotic, he was the only one who realized that Felix's clones had insane coordination, leaving him little room for recovery. Overwhelmed and damaged, Uranus did something he had absolutely not done before in his life before a Unigen. Phase out. He broke into vibrations and escaped from Felix's onslaughter. When his form was reconstructed again, he was on the other side of the clock tower, wounded and bleeding from many areas of his body. He gazed at Felix and his clones with rage burning down his chest as he wiped the blood out of his nose, tainting his grey beard. Not bad, but you have merely squandered your resources on those temporary immunities. He sneered, all I have to do is buy time until it expires. Two seconds? Two minutes? It doesn't matter to me. You are truly unwise if you assumed that this is the full scope of my preparation. The seven clones spoke at once, their eyes gleaming with seven different colors, but they all shared one thing, absolute confidence. The Wrath clone raised his hand calmly and uttered, Avaricious Maelstrom of Corruption. Reclaim the clock tower. 1780 Freeze. With a sudden, Explosive gesture, Felix slammed his palms together, releasing the avaricious maelstrom at the clockwork tower. A massive swirling vortex of crimson energy erupted, spiraling outwards with ferocious speed and intensity, threatening to devour anything in sight. Whoosh! Whoosh! The maelstrom was a terrifying sight to behold, having a center with a deep shade of blood red that seemed to throb with hunger. Meanwhile, the outer edges were tainted with darker hues of evil energy. As the vortex expanded, the symbols of wrath and greed fueled it, causing its corruptive power to intensify with each rotation. This was Felix's first sin symbolic technique that had evil energy added to the mix. He had created it while he was in the Eternal Kingdom amongst the original twenty techniques. He never found a great time to use it since evil energy was quite useless against Unigens. But, in the quantum realm? It was the ultimate weapon. In mere milliseconds, the maelstrom engulfed the clockwork tower, seeping into its intricate gears and polished metal surfaces, corroding and tainting it. The tower's very structure seemed to groan under the weight of corruption, causing Uranus' expression to turn ugly at the sight. Bastard! He is trying to gain ownership of the tower. The understanding had struck him akin to a chilling dagger piercing his heart. He understood that if Felix succeeded, he would be able to manipulate time in the clockwork tower. This would affect him too and there wasn't much he could do about it since the tower's authority was absolute. Eris. Get in here quickly. 
Uranus called for support and agitation. I can't, he has locked down the floor. Eris responded calmly, even if I want to turn my wisp into a portal, it won't work. All you can do is buy time until the temporary spatial lockdown expires. Arg, so f asterisking useless. Furious, he pulled out his divine scythe, deciding to take matters into his own hands. He released his radiant slash resplendent divinities to the limit and phased back into the mayhem. He swung his scythe widely, releasing a powerful vibration wave at the crimson storm. Alas, Felix was prepared to defend it with his life. Absolute zero chill. The seven clones waved their hands simultaneously, releasing chilling mist from their palms at the invisible vibrations, targeting them solely. The vibrations halted in their place immediately while the crimson mist kept doing its business. What? This sight startled Uranus, making him turn his widened eyes to Felix, seemingly wondering how he pulled it off. His reaction was comprehensible as not even Poseidon was able to freeze his vibrations in time. I may not be as good as you at controlling vibrations, but my understanding is deep enough to intercept your attacks. Felix and his clones utilized their insane speed to appear right next to him from all directions and start another round of bombardment, at the same time, he was giving him a lecture. As long as I can read your vibrations frequency, they are nothing but useless soundless noises. Boom! The moment that sentence resounded in Uranus' ears, one of the clones covered his fist in transferred purified quantum-based void energy, and smashed Uranus right in the back. Uranus had used his peak defensive technique this time, which protected him easily by breaking the void energy into its original form. This happened to all of Felix's strikes regardless of their nature, whether he used elemental energy or quantum energy as its source. But, Felix didn't care, his goal had been achieved. The clockwork tower had been corrupted successfully and there was nothing Uranus could do about it anymore. Devour him! Felix ordered coldly as he remained close to Uranus, who was defending himself from the attack of seven Unigens. At this moment, anyone would wish to go against seven individual Unigens than seven perfect clones of Felix. Clones that could use all available sin symbolic strategies due to the seven dragonic tails being cloned all together for each. What's worse? Felix was also capable of commanding vibrations which allowed him to mess up with Uranus' attempt to escape either through phasing out or breaking into vibrations. Phasing out or such abilities required perfect control over frequencies since it allowed them to hop from one parallel plane to another. Felix constantly disturbed those frequencies, making it impossible for Uranus to match his entire existence into one. Each time his form turned illusionary, it crashed out, and he received another beating from seven sides. This kept happening while Asna's core was pulling his core out of his body against his will, seeking to feast on it. SHT, SHT, SH asterisk T. Uranus kept getting disturbed and a bit afraid of the current development, feeling like he had absolutely no control over the battle's momentum. Now, even his core was about to get merged with Asna's. He understood that the moment they got merged, his life would be over. Thus, he knew only a drastic countermeasure could save his ass. Since Felix still possessed the temporary immunities, even if he targeted him, nothing would work. Thus, he decided to abuse his laws and leave the floor altogether by destroying and reconstructing his form somewhere else. It was like being born from literal scratch, following the exact compounding frequencies that brought him into existence. It was an ultimatum survival skill and he didn't want to use it unless nothing else was left. After all, he would be chained up again after his form was reconstructed. But still, it would be better than having his core devoured. Alas, he was a tad too late. Strings collab. Freeze. With a single order from Felix, the massive clock's nine hands, which had been ticking for eternity, screeched to a sudden halt. As the hands froze in place, so too did everything within the tower. An eerie stillness shrouded the floor. Uranus was caught mid-motion, becoming a statue of defiance and desperation, his divine weapon engulfed in resplendent divinity froze too. Even his radiant divinity, 
which was supposed to defend him from any type of law, wasn't spared. This alone was shocking, and logic-defying, just like the tower standing up to the universe's order before. Felix and his clones, scattered around Uranus, stopped as if turned to stone, their faces locked with various expressions. Not even he was spared from the freezing effect. Meanwhile, the elemental attacks, techniques, corrupted gears, and even the smallest particles of dust hanging in the air, were all caught in the temporal lock that Felix had imposed. Yet, the most shocking part was the tenants fell under the same freezing spell, leaving them gazing at the sky with widened pupils, not a single thought in their minds, Lilith and Eris were included too. This was enough to showcase that it wasn't a normal time freezing ability. Any ability that could bypass the absoluteness of divinities or celestial flames was considered at the level of the universe's authority. In other words, this was the stone of reality putting down its foot on this floor's iron-clad rules. However, in the heart of this frozen tableau, a single entity remained unaffected. An entity with an authority above celestial energy or divinities. An entity with perfect immunities to all laws and elements. An entity that was believed to be the lost consciousness of the universe. It was none other than a SNES core. With the world around it paused, and everyone's minds halted in place the core continued its work. Unhindered by the temporal freeze, it kept devouring Uranus' exposed frozen core right before his widened lifeless eyes. The process was silent but intense, yet no one was watching it, their eyes were on it, but it meant nothing. While this strange plan seemed to have worked perfectly, leaving Uranus with zero counter since nothing besides a SNES core could stand against the tower's authority, it posed a good question. How the F asterisk CK would Felix unfreeze himself again when his thoughts and actions had been paused too? 1781 Ultimate Survival Techniques Many years ago, within the void, Felix was sitting at the central table with the rest of the tenants, discussing their upcoming strategy to take down either Uranus or Eris. Since your first fight will be held on the 20th floor, you have to come up with a plan that utilizes the environment to your advantage. Spatial lockdown isn't enough. Thor said. Indeed, especially when your immunities and spatial lockdown will be temporary. Lady Sphinx nodded, you can't rely on your powers alone. The moment Uranus or Eris will feel an ounce of danger, I have a feeling they will find a way to escape with their sets of laws. Really? Isn't the tower's authority supreme? Cyclope rubbed his chin in puzzlement. How will he be able to escape during the lockdown? Before anyone could respond, Lilith invaded their meeting, manifesting in the center of the table. She sat down with one hand resting on her knee nonchalantly. Everyone's eyelids twitched but remained silent, already used to her unusual entrances. Let me put you on some game. Lilith licked a rainbow lollipop as she shared casually. Both Uranus and Eris possess an ultimate survival ability that can get them out of life and death situations for a steep price. In the case of Uranus, he has used it before to escape from the first floor after the stone of reality almost snatched his life away. Can you show us? Felix asked with a deep frown, I would rather see your whole journey in the tower with Eris, Uranus and Ares. He is right, if you are trying to help, you might as well put some real effort into it. Thor said coldly, not pleased with Lilith's withholding information from them. He knew that it was hypocritical to ask for her full cooperation when they had no intentions of forgiving her for what she had done to Felix or them. Still, he wasn't a fan of the way she was helping Felix, sharing with him the bare minimum and always withholding critical intel. Too bad, Lilith wasn't to be pressured or threatened. Hmm, Nat, I don't feel like it. Lilith yawned. If you are interested in our journey, reach the first floor and you will know. What do? Before Felix could interject, Lilith returned to the main subject, now, do you want to know their flawless escaping abilities or not? Do tell. Felix dropped the subject at once, not wanting to antagonize Lilith. He knew that she was too fickle and could change her mind quite easily. Let's start with Uranus. When SH asterisk T hit the fan and he realizes that nothing will get him out, he decides to abuse his laws and use a technique he calls, 
strings call a pasturation. I know, I know, it has a tragic name. Lilith chuckled when she saw their weird reactions to the name. But, its effect is the real deal. It allows him to collapse his shape at the strings level and restore his form somewhere else else he has already picked or marked. Since it is happening in the vibrational strings realm, it allows him to move past dimensions and whatnot. SH asterisk T, does this means my dimensional lockdown or the tower's authority won't hold him down? Felix frowned. Yab. But how can he move past the tower's authority? Candace raised an eyebrow in surprise. He can because he genuinely destroys his shape and rebuilds it somewhere else else. Felix explained it with a serious tone, it's different than using dimensional abilities or such. The tower can do nothing to anyone desiring to kill himself. I see. Candace murmured. She realized that if Uranus managed to pop this technique, there was literally nothing Felix could do to stop it unless he abused his laws too. How about you wish to make him forget such technique or better yet, make the vibrations static against him? Lord Marduk suggested. No, they are way too risky. Felix shook his head, whether it succeeds or fails, I will be punished heavily. By the time I finish with him, the chains will seal my powers and this will force me to enter one of the temporary rooms to get rid of the chains. The dimensional lockdown would have expired by then, and I am certain Eris wouldn't miss such a free opportunity to capture me. Felix wanted to stay as far as possible from abusing his laws ever again. While the results were almost always positive, the aftermath was too much to handle. He barely survived the last time after he abused his laws. If it wasn't for Apollo and the Goddess of Luck holding his hand, he would be chained up in some basement in the three-dimensional pocket. Thus, it was the very, very, last option to consider. Then, what? If even the Stone of Reality failed to take down Uranus and you refuse to abuse your laws, how can you ensure his core gets devoured? Lord Loki inquired while leaning against his chair, wondering if it was possible to pull it off in those conditions. Everyone went silent, even Felix. As the silence began to prevail in the central plaza, Lady Yggdrasil glanced right and left. Then, she suggested with a gentle breezy tone, is it possible to gain control over the clockwork tower by corrupting it? Corrupting the tower? I don't think it's possible to do it before the dimensional lockdown dies out. Thor knitted his eyebrows, even if he does it, how will it work to his advantage? He can freeze the time or something. Won't it affect him too? I don't know, he can use celestial flames or wish for time immunity to combat it. If he can use celestial flames against it, doesn't this mean Uranus divinities will work too? True, hmm. Maybe the tower's authority will override the divinity's effects. While the tenants were deep in their discussion about the validity of this strategy, Felix remained affixed in his position the moment he heard the suggestion. It was like it gave him the inspiration he needed to come up with his own strategy. As his mind kept running over thousands of simulations if he went for it, he finally landed on the perfect approach. He brought out the map to the tower and scrolled through the details related to the clockwork tower. Although he remembered it to heart, he still read it again, seemingly seeking confirmation with his eyes. When he reached the line he desired, a sinister smile emerged on his lips and kept widening the more he read it. When the tenants noticed Felix's sudden aura change, they quietened down and gazed at him with intrigued looks. You got something. If Uranus is the one left to guard the twentieth floor, I can confidently say. Felix smiled coldly. He has signed his death warranty. Without needing them to ask, Felix went forward and gave them the details of his plan. The moment he finished, everyone was left staring at him in astonishment and a bit of dread. To even come up with something like this, his scheming abilities have started to scare me. This was the only thought coursing through the majority of the tenants' minds. Back to the clockwork tower. Asna's core was close to finishing its feast. It took almost no effort since Uranus' core could not resist it while its owner was frozen in time. After the core was devoured, Asna's core returned inside Felix's chest and settled neatly. Meanwhile, 
Uranus's body remained affixed without much change to it. Frozen time or not, his body would remain the same unless Felix gave an order for its destruction. With the Sna's core finishing its devouring process, nothing was left moving on the floor. The moment this happened a subtle stirring began to manifest itself apart from the suspended chaos. From the shadows of the clockwork tower, a figure emerged. Unlike the frozen beings caught in the temporary halt, this entity moved with purposeful autonomy. He appeared as a humanoid soldier toy, his body articulated with polished brass joints and panels of finely carved wood. The most distinctive feature was a slowly winding key protruding from his back. This was the clockwork tower engineer. 1782 Eris. Save me. Robotically, the clockwork engineer surveyed the scene with his small glass-like eyes. When they landed on Felix and Uranus both frozen mid-conflict, he paused for a second. Then, he lowered his gaze, showing no interest in the drama between them. He had only one mission, fix any alternation or damages to the clocks. With steady steps, the engineer approached the central mechanism of the tower, the grand clock whose hands had been halted by Felix's command. Reaching the base of the clock, the engineer climbed the stairs with great familiarity, navigating the labyrinth of gears and levers with ease. As he reached the clock's mechanism, he pulled from his belt a set of small, perfectly crafted tools. He started adjusting the gears, tightened springs, and realigned the clock's hands. In almost no time, he brought life back to the clock. As he made the final adjustment, the clock's hands shuddered, then began to move once more. There were nine hands, each representing a time frame, starting from a second to a million years for the biggest hand. With the clock's mechanism restored, the engineer stepped back, his expression as deadpan as always. He dusted his hands, a human-like gesture of completion, and without a glance at Felix and Uranus still frozen in time, he began his descent. After reaching the floor of the tower, the clockwork engineer took a few steps away and his form began to fade into nothingness. Just as the last of his figure disappeared, the tower vibrated gently, and life was brought back to the heart of the floor. Felix, Uranus and all the elements of the frozen battle rushed into motion at once, leaving everyone disoriented. We back. Since Felix had planned for all of this, he was the first to break out of his daze and switch his focus to the interior of Asna's core. The moment he saw a sphere made out of vibrations, gravity, antimatter, and illuminating with colorful radiation, hovering akin to a moon, a wide cruel grin manifested on his face. He directed it at the stunned Uranus, whose face became as pale as a sheet paper. Uranus lifted his head slowly, his terrified and disbelieving eyes coming into contact with Felix's. You, how, impasse. Food. Before he could finish his sentence, the elemental attacks from before landed on him directly, bombarding him from every direction. With his core devoured and control completely stolen by Asna's core, his defensive techniques and powers were stripped instantly. This left him as vulnerable as any mortal. Cough. Cough. The assaults left him heavily injured and coughing buckets of blood with bloodshot eyes. If it wasn't for Felix holding back at the last nanosecond, those attacks would have ended him. Just as he was about to fall into the ground, Felix caught him by his grayed-out hair and lifted him until he was face to face. Then, he clicked his tongue with a terrifying sinister smile, T.S., 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 easy there, easy there, I can't have you die on me now. Woo! It actually worked. I can't believe it. In the meantime, Candace exclaimed excitedly the instant she was brought out of her daze and figured out what was going on. You had doubts. Thor smirked cockily, there is no way a student of mine drops the ball. He has taken a great risk, but I am glad it worked out. Elder Crocken smiled softly, if his assumption or the map's tips were wrong, no one can tell what would have happened. Haha. <laughs> He really bypassed an upper celestial unigen's ultimate survival technique. Lord Loki chuckled, look at Uranus' face, he still couldn't believe it. I will pay anything to read his mind at the moment. 
Although Uranus was still alive and kicking, the tenants celebrated Felix's victory enthusiastically. It was understandable, with Uranus' core devoured, his fate was sealed to be decided by Felix. Uranus knew this too, which made it impossible for him to accept it. In agonizing pain, his mouth and nose dripping fountains of blood, tainting his beard, he still kept muttering under his breath with great difficulty, How, how, cough, how? If he wasn't overwhelmed and in utter disbelief at losing his core, he could have figured out Felix's plan. Alas, he merely kept repeating how, 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 akin to a broken record. But soon, he recalled that he still had Eris in his mind. His eyes lit up with a tinkle of crazed hope as he beseeched, Eris. Help me. Use your chaos laws and bring me back my core. Please. We are allies. Help me. Watching this sight from his consciousness space, Eris remained silent. But, a hint of impressiveness was caught at the depth of her pupils as she directed her eyes at Felix's diabolic face. Taking advantage of Asna's social status, which is equal to the stone of reality, and the clockwork tower engineer's strict maintenance job to pull this off is not something I expected. She commentated to herself. She swiftly figured out that Felix had planned all of this from the first move he made. She noticed him giving Uranus a false supposition that he could rely on his phasing abilities to escape any time he felt threatened. If Felix wanted, he could have stopped Uranus from escaping by interfering with the frequencies at the very first assault. But, this would have forced Uranus to either utilize strings collapse duration or use another extreme measure to push Felix off him. Felix couldn't risk that, thus, he allowed him to run away. This gave him the chance to kick off the corruption maelstrom and bring the clockwork tower under his rule. Of course, Uranus wouldn't stand by and watch him do this. Since he was put under the false assumption he could phase out any time he desired, he didn't hesitate to re-engage to halt the corruption. Felix had predicted this would occur since Uranus would not use his ultimate survival technique unless he was left with no options. So, he relaunched his next assault, and this time, he made sure to interrupt Uranus' phasing abilities while commanding Asna to devour his core, leaving him at last with only one option. Alas, by the time Uranus steeled his heart, Felix already commanded the time to freeze, knowing that Asna's core wouldn't be affected and that the clock's engineer was bound to make an appearance and fix the clock. He was certain because he read this in the map's details about the floor. The clockwork tower's engineer makes a periodical appearance for checkups and fixes the clocks with their hands altered. If the main clock is altered in any shape or form, he makes an emergency checkup and fixes it. Felix's entire strategy was built on the second sentence. It wasn't like there weren't any risks. The fix hadn't been explored in detail. It could have meant resetting the entire floor back to its original state or reversing the time before he corrupted it. Fortunately there weren't such complications, the engineer came and unfoze the time, nothing more, nothing else. Eris. Save me, UB asterisk TCH. Save me. Save me. Meanwhile, Uranus had completely misplaced it and started screaming out loud with a crazed expression, spit and blood flying everywhere. Alas, Eris didn't bother to entertain him still marveling at Felix's strategic mind and his crazy boldness to freeze himself in time, not knowing for certain if he would ever wake up. Eris? Hehe, he, even the three rulers won't be able to save you now. Felix showed a grim smile as he choked out Uranus with one hand, remember when you tortured me in the Void Realm? Well, it's your lucky day. From this day onward, I am going to make sure you never, never, forget it. Felix murmured the last sentence near Uranus' ears, sending chills coursing down his spine. Ariaeus. 1783 I am on your side. How annoying. Smack. With one backhanded slap, Uranus went silent, his eyes rolling at the back of his head. Felix placed a palm in front of Uranus' face and extracted his entire soul, throwing him inside his consciousness space. Uranus landed on the hard plaza floor face first, the tenants couldn't care less to soften his landing. 
Do we wake him up? Candace asked with a wide grin, feeling quite excited to be given a chance to torture a Unijin. Her reaction was shared by most tenants as none of them dreamed of such an opportunity before. After the humiliating experience they went through under Lilith's hands, they were never given the chance to vent out. Even ancestral dragon Immer felt a different kind of emotion as he watched Uranus lying stone cold on the ground. It's not the time. Felix said calmly as he picked up Uranus' limb body with a finger and crucified him near the central table, leaving him hanging there. As for his physical body, Felix disintegrated it into particles with a wave of a hand. Of course, he picked up his divine bronze scythe and placed it in his dimensional bag, accompanying Demeter's divine lance. Felix didn't bother to use the lance since it wasn't his fighting style and he would rather fight empty-handed comfortably than use something he never touched before. Fortunately, the divine weapons maintained their shrunken status even after the death of their owners. Otherwise, they would have increased their size until they covered the entire floor and got stuck in it. After all, it was impossible to escape the tower through enlargement. Now, let's deal with the real threat, Felix uttered with a solemn tone as he brought out two chairs and placed them in front of Uranus' crucified body. He sat on one and held his hands together his fingers locked and shut, while his elbows rested on his knees, not an ounce of joy was seen in his face ever after taking down one of his most hated enemies. His attitude was understandable. Uranus was a difficult monster to handle, however, he was not at his peak strength whatsoever. He could not use gravity, antimatter, or radiation law within the quantum realm without tapping in first to the quantum energy. However, Felix made it impossible for him to use it due to his gluttony-based techniques in play. They sucked in quantum energy faster than he could bother to transfer it. Since the fight took less than two seconds, he wasn't given enough time to explore other options before he decided to escape. Felix had him controlled and dominated from the start to the end, this was the benefit of being the first to make a move. But now? It was nearly impossible to replicate those results against Eris and Felix knew it. Thus, he decided to give Eris one last chance to change her mind and choose his side even if it meant not getting her core. That's how much he dreaded his upcoming battle against her, for his preparations were nowhere near as perfect as against Uranus. Eris, I know you can hear me. He permitted composedly, you can enter my consciousness space. You have my word nothing bad will befall you. Felix meant it and was going to abide by his word even if Eris rejected his proposal. After all, she had also done the same when she caught his clone in the Celestial City. She might have killed him, but it could have gone much worse if she desired. Suddenly, Eris' consciousness wisp emerged from within Uranus' soul and landed softly on her toe. She gazed at Felix with a faint smile and said, it seems like you still haven't given up on me, I am flattered. For you, I am willing to try a hundred times if I have to, Felix intoned sincerely, please, have a seat. No need, I won't be here for long. Eris rejected while her eyes jumped from one tenant to another and the massive peculiar town around her. I have to say, for a paragon of sins, you have too many friends. She chuckled. I can't see that SL asterisk TTY vixen with even one loyal partner. Who are you calling a SL asterisk T? Four-eyed witch. Lilith manifested out of nowhere with an annoyed expression. At least my glasses are a fashion choice, unlike you. Eris taunted while pushing her glasses up her nose. Fashion? I doubt a bookworm like you can even understand the word. Lilith said while removing her sunglasses hitting her with a mocking look. As they kept ridiculing each other, Felix and the rest of the tenants kept glancing at each other in silence. Their appearance prompted questions about whether they were truly unigens or just two mean high school girls. All right, that's enough. I didn't call you to have you bicker with Lilith. In the end, Felix could no longer listen to them and decided to intervene, having no interest in trusting Eris fully. In his eyes, she might decide to launch her assault the moment the spatial lockdown was removed, which would ruin his plans if she rejected to cooperate. As you say, hubby. 
Lilith blew Felix a seductive kiss and sat in the corner, unbothered by Felix's eyelids twitching in annoyance. At least, with her out of the picture, Felix and Eris could focus on the main subject again. However, just as Felix was about to request her to join his side again, believing that after he took out Uranus, she might throw her lot in his box, Eris raised her hand gently and said, Don't waste your breath, my decision remains unchanged. Felix and the rest of the tenants couldn't help but show deep frowns in displeasure. You said before, you have chosen my side, but how come you are so desperate for a fight? I don't get it. Why are you so hellbent on fighting me? I have a feeling that you aren't doing it for the three rulers, so why? Felix asked, his tone laced with confusion and a hint of anger. Eris was always an enigma in his eyes. She acted friendly without aggression, but simultaneously, she refused to join his side. The fact that she was extremely close to Asna in her childhood made him more irritated by her decision to be against him even when she uttered otherwise. You still haven't figured it out. Eris smiled faintly, I am not sure if you are denying the truth or if you genuinely haven't comprehended it yet. Whatever it is, I am awaiting you on the first floor. Without waiting for Felix to respond, Eris destroyed her own consciousness wisp. As she was fading away, she turned one last time and advised, Take as much time as you need for your preparation, I won't leave the first floor. Those were the last words resounding in the silent expanse of consciousness space. No one said anything, but the look in their eyes spoke volumes about this development. Some had understood what Eris had meant while some were still ignorant or refusing to accept the truth. The truth was simple. She wants to hand me her core, but only if I defeat her and prove to be worthy of it. Felix uttered with a confused look, unable to comprehend how Eris' thought worked. How could a Unigen ever determine to hand his core willingly to another? This was the reason he didn't understand what she meant by on his side for a long time. Is this real? Or is it a ploy? Felix wondered as he gazed into the distance, having no idea if he should trust her words or not. The last time he believed a Unigen, he resulted in almost getting enslaved. 1784 The Fifth Ascension If she truly meant it, then, she won't be using her ultimate survival technique even if her life was at risk. Lady Sphinx remarked with a thoughtful expression. Indeed, this changes everything we have planned. This was the reason Felix wasn't delighted with Eris' implication of being on his side. If he trusted her words and acted on the basis she had no interest in running away from him, then, he had to change his approach entirely. After all, it would mean that Eris was going to fight him to death regardless of the final outcome. All I am wondering is why is she doing this? She is too smart and ambitious to accept the idea of handing her core to another. Elder Crocken knitted his eyebrows in puzzlement. If it was any other Unigen with suicidal tendencies, then maybe, they could accept it. But, Eris wasn't the one they expected to make such a suggestion. I am sure she will tell you about it on the first floor. Lilith yawned lazily, Eris might be a lot of things, but she isn't one to bullsh asterisk t. If she says something, she means it. Felix still had doubts, but he understood no one was going to clarify them besides Eris herself. Thus, he threw the matter to the back of his mind and focused on what he could do. For now, we will continue as planned. Felix switched to his main consciousness in the clockwork tower and began his preparation to ascend with Uranus core. The first thing he did was wish to renew the temporal spatial lockdown on the floor hoping that Nimmo and his Void Nation got his back with the resources. Luckily, the wish went through without a hassle, which pleased Felix quite a bit. Seems like little Nimmo is putting out the work. You have no idea. Do you want to see? Candace chuckled. No need. Felix smiled, I will see him when I handle things down here. Felix would rather not get distracted with anything unrelated to Eris at the moment. Since he wished for a temporal lockdown again, he had to take advantage of the short duration and ascend with Uranus core. If it was up to him, he would have abused his laws and wished for a permanent spatial lockdown. Then, 
he would use the floor to his advantage and remove the chains. However, if he went for this, he would risk having a Sna waking up while he was serving the punishment. After all, the time would go as normal outside of the chosen room. As for the ability to experience the hasten time flow without actually affecting reality, Felix realized that it was bogus, either that or he had no idea how it could work. Still, Felix went inside one of the rooms and placed a clone outside to guard him. Instead of speeding up the time, he slowed it down. This should provide me enough time to ascend with Uranus core and explore his laws, Felix said as he sat in a meditation position inside the dark room. Without further ado, Felix commended the ascension by willing Uranus core to merge with the heart associated with his greed dragonic tail. Roar! Listening to the call, the fox dragonic head emerged while roaring thunderously. As the core touched the heart, it was consumed in a burst of radiant energy and followed by an epic transformation. The dragon's scales, which were once a deep, avaricious green, now beamed with new silvery tones reflecting the intricate laws of vibration and antimatter. Meanwhile, the dragon's eyes lit up with a new kind of light, one that pulsed with the power of gravity manipulation, causing slight bends in the space around it. It roared again, but this time, its breath carried a specific crackle of radiation, leaving trails of glowing particles that decayed slowly in the air. Since Felix was no longer chained up, he watched the process with satisfaction, feeling not an ounce of pain as the previous times. Soon, the ascension process was concluded after the last modification took place on the scales. They used to be smooth green, but now, each one was imbued with the soul of antimatter, threatening to annihilate any matter it came into contact with. As the transformation was completed, the fox dragonic head turned its massive head towards Felix, its eyes showing nothing but acknowledgement and loyalty. Felix reached out a hand, touching the snout of the beast with a gentle smile. Greedy little fella, these powers suit you well, Felix chuckled. The only reason he had chosen the fox dragonic head was to satisfy its inst antiable greed, knowing that he wouldn't stop bothering him if he merged the core with another dragonic tail. Congratulations on another successful ascension. Five down, two more to go. Thor celebrated with a pleased smile. It's really difficult to believe that you have five Unigen cores under your control. Candace expressed, her eyes displaying a tint of awe. Neither can we. Hormongondra smiled wryly, if you were to tell me that our little boy is going to be as strong as five Unigens combined before, I would have laughed at you. He is truly collecting laws like they are different candies. How many does he have now? Lord Loki and Wizard himself, we have wrath, sloth, greed, gluttony, pride, envy, lust, fire, plasma, magma, water, ice fog, lightning, magnetism, void, radiation, antimatter, vibration, sound, charm, gravity, blood, and some other laws subsidized from the main ones. Five Unigen cores were enough to provide Felix more than 23 laws slash elements. However, he only had two more openings since Lilith's core was merged with his human heart. After all, his first ascension was with her core and the rest followed. The most optimal ending is ascending with Eris and Ares cores. Lady Sphinx remarked, those two cores possess the most powerful known laws in the universe. They are a must if you plan to face against the three rulers. I know, but let's not get caught in the moment. Felix narrowed his eyes, although Eris showed her desire to join the cause, if I can't take her down, she won't hesitate to bring me to the three rulers. Felix understood where Eris was coming from. He was requesting her to join his side without a fight, but, if he was in her place, he would have done the same. Why pick his side if he could not even defeat her? It spoke volumes about their fate when they went against the three rulers. The only thing he couldn't understand was her willingness to hand over her core. He believed she could still test him and join his side if he defeated her without giving up on her identity. Soon, he shook his head and dropped the matter not wanting to waste his time on speculations. As Lilith said, he would find out the truth if he entered the first floor. 
Let's see what kind of sin symbolic techniques I can create with those new laws. With an eager expression, Felix began brainstorming ideas with the rest of the tenants, understanding that the key to defeating Eris was those new techniques. Fortunately, he had the space and the time to perfect his preparations. Meanwhile, at the ground level of the Echoing Tower, Eris kept her word and didn't budge an inch. She also didn't place a trap or such. She just kept peacefully reading her book, not an ounce of nervousness or worry was picked from her visage. With the massive cracked heart above and the ever-changing environment of the first floor in the background, she resembled the ultimate boss of a game, awaiting the adventurer, who was coming to slay her. Only this time, no one could predict the outcome. 1785 Can you handle the truth? I. Many years down the line, Felix had completed the final phase of his meticulous preparations. Over what felt like mere moments but spanned much longer outside this specialized realm, Felix had honed his abilities, fused new powers, created new sin symbolic techniques, and strategized against the final boss of Echoing Towers saga. If it was up to him, he would have spent more time with his preparation. However, he refused to get caught inside the time chambers after the temporal spatial lockdown expired. Thus, he stepped outside of the room, his boots echoing softly on the wooden floor of the clockwork tower. Without turning back, he approached the portal that led to the 19th floor. It was one of the standardized time chambers within the tower, making it nearly impossible to realize its true identity. Yet, the true difficulty lay in activating the exit. Based on the map details, the keyword should be this, Felix murmured as he manipulated the clock hands. He made circles, half circles, and sometimes even double spins. In the end, he affixed the clock hands on very peculiar specific numbers. The moment he was done, he took a step back and watched the clock hands suddenly spin faster and faster until it created a space-time deformity on the door. Whoosh! With one last hefty breeze blowing his hair, the entire clock turned into a chaotic spinning white vortex, consuming the entire door. Damn, without the map, how can anyone figure out the exit? Candace felt goosebumps, won't they get trapped on this floor for eternity? Without the map, I doubt anyone will make it to this floor alive. Lady Sphinx said calmly. The more this map's details turn correct, the more it freaks me out. Lord Loki uttered with a deep frown, how can it even exist? If even Unigens can't write it, then who did it? Those questions played in everyone's minds daily as the moment Felix stepped into the tower, they saw more crazy sh asterisk t than their entire lifespan. From strange powerful creatures to the universe's authority getting challenged. We are closer than ever to the truth. Felix narrowed his eyes at the portal, I just need to handle the last hurdle. While he called Eris a hurdle, Felix knew she was going to be his biggest challenge besides the three rulers. Thus, Felix's mind raced through the final checks of his strategy and the potential scenarios he might face. Taking a deep breath, Felix buried his doubts deep within and then manifested a blood clone linked with him. He ordered it to enter the portal, believing that Eris must have adjusted the portal's destination to the first floor. Even if it wasn't for him she needed to do it to facilitate the travel between her and Uranus. As expected, the moment Felix's blood clone went through it, he emerged on the other side of the first floor. Whoa -a -ah. What is this place? It resembled the end's world. The hell, just like the map said, the environment is constantly changing. The tenants were left with widened eyes and jaws on the floor, shocked speechless by the surreal and chaotic scenes before them. Their reaction was understandable as the first floor's environment defied all notions of reality and physics, resembling a glitched-out game. They were immediately greeted by the sight of a star sliced cleanly in half, yet still burning fiercely, suspended in the sky like a celestial anomaly. Its radiant heat and mysterious light bathed the landscape in a constant, ominous glow. The flora here was equally bizarre. The trees did not adhere to any known biological principles. Their trunks were traditional, but instead of leaves, entire branches sprouted from their limbs, 
each branch ending in clusters of leaves like strange, living fractals. This botanical oddity gave the forest an unnatural appearance as if the trees themselves were creatures from a dreamer's imagination. Is that a sea of liquid fire or am I just tripping? Thor asked speechlessly as he gazed at a floating sea of liquid fire, defying gravity and reason. This ocean hung midair, its waves moving gently, casting flickering reflections and shadows over the land below. Yet, the craziest was saved for last as the sky was filled with celestial oddities. Moons and other celestial bodies and shapes unheard of, ranging from triangles, squares and other polygons, orbiting in the skies. While the tenants were discussing those abnormalities, Felix's eyes were affixed on one thing and one thing only, the stone of reality high above. Kotham. With each thunderous heartbeat, it was releasing that peculiar miasma from its cracks. Why do I feel some kind of familiarity with it? Felix murmured as he placed a hand over his chest, feeling his heartbeats somehow harmonizing with the beats of the stone of reality. What do you mean? Lady Sphinx and the others broke out of their daze and focused on Felix. I don't know how to explain it. Felix added confusedly, it's like both my human heart and a snizz core are calling for it. This made it more puzzling for the tenants as they kept glancing at each other with weird looks, seemingly trying to make sense of his words. Before Felix could dive deeper into that sensation, Eris' voice suddenly resounded on the floor. Little Paragon, come in. I am waiting on the other side. Ah, also, don't worry, there are no traps. I will be the judge of that. Felix's expression turned serious again. He wasn't an idiot to take her words for granted. He pulled back the blood clone and sent it inside one of his perfect clones this time. He used a wish to check for chaos law abnormalities. When it came back negative, he steeled his heart and entered the first floor. You must be wondering why are you feeling a familiar kind of energy coming from the stone of reality. Eris' voice kept echoing in the distance. Instead of responding, Felix used his new mastery of vibrational laws to track the source of the sound. It took him no time to reach the origin and find out Eris, sitting cross-legged on a white field of roses with a book on her lap. The moment their senses clashed, Eris raised her head and showed a small smile while extending her hand in front. Please, join me. Felix could detect the sincerity and lack of malice in her voice. As the paragon of sins, no one could have hidden evil intentions before him. Still, just to be cautious, he sent a clone to meet her, not wanting to jeopardize his cores. After traveling the great expanse of the first floor and seeing all kinds of bizarre anomalies, Felix finally arrived at the white field of roses, fully shielded up. With the first step, a wave of tiny white insects flew out of the roses and went into the distance, leaving their area utterly barren. F asterisking hell, this is a field of insects, be careful. Thor and the rest of the tenants buffed a hint of concern as they watched Felix clear out a trail inside the field of roses until he reached Eris. With no more than ten meters between them, he sat on the ground and bowed his head politely. Eris, I am truly done with the games. All my life, people kept hiding truths from me or going out of their way to gaslight me into believing in lies. Felix eyed Eris with a solemn but pleading look, whatever happens between us after, I genuinely hope you can tell me the truth and nothing but the full truth. From the primogenitors, to Asna, and now Lilith. All of them hid or used to hide truths from him for the sake of his protection. Felix always hated that as he was not a child who couldn't think for himself. In his mind, no matter how shocking was the truth, he could handle it. He always did and would always do. Thus, if Eris brought him for a discussion, then he expected her to tell him the full truth without holding back, otherwise, he might as well not waste his time and start their battle. Eris could see his true feelings in his eyes, which made her erase the small smile planted on her face. I also have no interest in lying to you. Never did. Never will. But, can you really handle the truth? Eris lifted her head and looked at the beating stone of reality for a moment. Yes. 
The moment she heard his response she descended her gaze until it was affixed to Felix's eyes and uttered calmly, I have yet to figure out the full truth and I doubt if even the three rulers know it. But, if there is one thing I am certain about, it is your identity. My identity. Felix knitted his eyebrows in confusion, not expecting her to go this way. Yes, for the next things I am about to say to make sense, you have to know about your true identity. Eris focused her eyes at Felix and declared with a monotone tone, I am 99% certain you are the first and lost consciousness of our universe. Hugh. 1786 Can you handle the truth? 2. As Eris's revelation hung in the air, a tangible silence swallowed the area and Felix's consciousness space. Felix, along with his tenants, stood utterly motionless, their expressions a mix of shock and incredulity. They had expected many things, but not in their wildest dreams did they expect the truth to be this ludicrous. The first and lost consciousness of the universe? Felix? A human of immortal origins? None of them managed to comprehend or accept Eris' insane statement. I know you find it hard to believe my words. Eris clarified calmly, unbothered by Felix's stunned silence, but, this is the truth and there is plenty of evidence to support it. Evidence? How could there be evidence? How could I be the consciousness of the universe? Are you mad? I am of human descent, I have a father, a mother, a grandfather, and a family that can be traced back centuries. Felix fired a series of questions, trying his best to maintain his composure, but a hint of agitation couldn't escape from his tone. He ought to feel this way, this wasn't a gender reveal. To find out that you were the consciousness of the universe implied many horrifying and shocking truths. Felix wasn't ready to face them in the slightest. But, he asked for the truth and Eris had no intentions of letting him back buttle from it no matter how hard he struggled to accept it. I never said that your human origin is false. Eris clarified with a soothing voice, I said that you are the lost consciousness of the universe. I don't know how exactly it happened, but I believe that your primal version has embedded its consciousness in Felix Maxwell during your birth or even after a couple of years, I can't tell for sure. Does she mean like possession? Candace covered her mouth in disbelief, having trouble keeping up with such insanity. Yes. Lady Sphinx confirmed with a serious tone, for the consciousness of the universe, the creator and owner of all matter, it should be quite simple to self-reincarnate choosing any creature he desires. But, what about his memories? I doubt he needs to force himself into forgetting his primal identity. Thor frowned, even if he did, why? He is already the overlord of the universe, the most omnipotent and holy. Why would he bother to erase his memories? Maybe he did it to experience a mortal life. Lord Shiva joined his voice as solemn as ever, I know for certain that such an omnipotent being would get bored easily with everything being under his feet. Enough. I am not the f asterisking consciousness of the universe. Hearing their discussion, Felix couldn't but snap in anger. Who could blame him? He felt a surreal detachment sweep over him as if he were suddenly a stranger in his mind, confronted with a piece of his identity that was as monumental as it was mystifying. Isn't the consciousness of the universe already believed to be Asna? Unlike me, she clears all the check marks for an omnipotent being. Felix retorted with narrowed eyes, her core can rival the three rulers pre-awakening. She can control all laws and elements. Most importantly, she went through hell because everyone was certain her awakening would make her gain control over the universe. Eris showed a wry smile and said, Little Paragon, I said that you are the first consciousness of the universe. Isn't this enough to imply that another one can emerge? Let's say you are right, how do you explain Asna's soul being perfectly compatible with you? A mere mortal human as you claim. Felix's lips parted slightly and murmured, L, luck. Even while he was saying it, he couldn't believe it himself. This wasn't the first time Felix interrogated this heavenly coincidence. He understood that two souls could match, but it was a one in an octillion chance, something on the border of impossibility, even twins possess a unique soul, 
shared by no one else. It was like each creature in this universe possessed a unique serial ID or a frequency that belonged to him alone. For two souls to synchronize to such perfection and without any side effects, was a miracle in writing. Both Felix and Asna had chunked it to the back of their minds, believing that it was a fated coincidence, especially, when they were reborn in a different timeline, which was just as shocking. Wait, my rebirth! The moment Felix recalled his rebirth with Asna, he didn't hesitate to bring it out and expose the truth. He believed it should kill off her claim. Alas, if only he knew how wrong he was. Yes, I admit that our souls matching up perfectly is too far-fetched to be a coincidence, but it is still a possibility. Felix held his stance strong, I am sure, because I died with Asna in my previous life and returned at least twenty years into the past. I can show you if you don't assume me. Felix extended his hand, ready to show her his memories of what happened in the ruins, uncaring about how humiliating it was. No need, I already know, Eris responded calmly. You know? How, it happened in my previous life. Both Felix and the tenants were shocked by her statement as it maintained many, many shocking implications, implications involving even them. Hmm. I thought you knew. Did that vixen tell you anything at all? Eris lifted an eyebrow in surprise. Cough. When Lilith heard her name be brought up, she lowered her sun hat, covering her face, seemingly having no interest in getting involved in this. Tell me what? Felix felt his heart skip a beat, feeling like another sledgehammer was about to smash his rationality. It seems like I have overestimated your knowledge base. Eris pointed a finger at Felix's forehead and manifested a memory orb, this should show you the whole truth of your rebirth and why I am certain about your true identity being the consciousness of the universe. Felix watched as the white orb floated slowly in his direction, his heart beats accelerating, his breaths turning shorter, yet, his slightly shaking finger reached out to the orb. His desire for the truth far surpassed any other emotion. The moment his finger touched the orb, a collection of memories invaded his mind. Many years ago, near the Universal Heart, the three rulers and Eris sat on their elevated platforms, releasing blinding divine light everywhere. Below them, a massive spiritual screen displayed Felix's squad, consisting of Jaden, and Kathy, standing before a gigantic heron amber gate. All of them were gazing at the small hole at the bottom of the gate with hints of excitement. Is it them? The second ruler requested with a gentle feminine voice. The prophecy hasn't given us names or races, just there will be a pivotal moment happening near us near ceiling grounds. The first ruler replied calmly, a pivotal moment that would finally kick off our great escape to the other side. I doubt it's them. The third ruler, Amonare remarked expressionlessly as he watched Felix and the other two crawl inside the small opening with eager expressions, feeling like they had hit the jackpot. How can those weakling bugs be associated with the prophecy? The previous explorers had a better chance. You can never tell. Eris remarked with a hint of interest as she watched Felix baiting his teammates into rushing first toward the white flame suspended on the platform. Oh, fresh souls to possess? Not bad. The moment Asna's angelic voice resounded in their ears, both Kathy and Jaden turned around and attempted to retreat having a bad feeling that their ending wouldn't be pleasant if they stuck behind. Phew! Phew! Alas, in an instant, two colorless flame needles were thrown with the speed of light at their heads. One penetrated Jaden's ear, and the other penetrated Kathy's eye. Ahhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
as she only kept screaming and begging for the pain to be over. Sadly, neither her wish was fulfilled, nor anyone came to her rescue. She only left two last whimpers before going silent once and for all. Tisk, she couldn't even handle the first stage of possession. Asna stated coldly, you better not disappoint me as well. Without a second delay, Felix turned around and lay on the floor, trying to crawl back inside the hole and leave this damned place. Ah, bad move. Eris covered her eyes, feeling sympathetic for what was about to happen next. 1787 Can you handle the truth? 3. As expected. Do you think the ones before you didn't use the same strategy as yours? Asna laughed like a deranged madwoman, I may not succeed in sinking our souls together, but at least I will add another butthole virginity to my collection. Thank you for that. She said sincerely. You crazy b asterisk tch. Scared out of his wits by what he just heard, Felix reflexively tried to turn around and protect his ass. Yet, the hole was too tight to let him make such a large movement. Hold on a second. Let's talk things through. He requested with a cracking voice, hoping to buy a couple of seconds to pass through the other side. Unfortunately, the moment his torso was inside the hole, leaving his lower body outside in the open, he heard Asna say in satisfaction, perfection. As all things should be. Nuuu. He screamed subconsciously, as he felt that his ass was being targeted by a rapist. Phew. The needle flew straight to his anus, resembling a dart hitting the bullseye. A -a 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 My ass is on fire. My butthole is burning. F asterisk CK, make IT stop please. I am sorry for ruining your sleep. Please let me go. Felix screamed like there was no tomorrow, tears and snot flowing down his face, as he rolled himself out of the cold from the hellish agony of having his ass pierced. Unbeknownst to him, all of this was being spectated by the strongest beings in the universe. As I said, weakling bugs, hmm. Just as the third ruler was about to close the spiritual mirror, his expressionless face finally displayed some emotions at the sight of Asna's soul synchronizing to perfection with Felix's. Impossible. Eris was the first to exclaim in shock. How uncanny. The first ruler lifted an eyebrow in surprise, even he was startled by this development. Is this the pivotal moment? It must be. But how? How can a mere mortal have a perfect synchronization with a celestial? The second ruler lost some of her composure, this is more impossible than the universe heat opening on its own. Having no clue that their soul synchronization had caused the most knowledgeable beings to lose their poise, Felix and Asna kept fighting over the ownership of the soul. Wait, how come Asna is struggling? Eris' eyes continued widening, it's a mere human soul. The fact that Asna couldn't overpower Felix's control over his soul and possess him instantly made them more befuddled. They understood that even while Asna was weakened immensely, she should have no problem possessing the soul of a weakling mortal no different than a commoner. His fate should have been just like Jaden's, Kathy's, or the millions of much more powerful souls than his. Before they could dive deeper into this discussion, Felix decided to blow his soul. This is for my butthole virginity. He shouted while his soul barrier began to collapse over the sea of consciousness. The shocking part was Asna's decision to merge with Felix's soul mid-collapse, knowing that even if she succeeded, she would end up erased with it. Do we intervene? The third ruler asked with a solemn tone. While the whole situation was confounding and made no sense to them, Amonare didn't want to watch Asna blow her soul up. She believed that it would give her the eternal peacefulness of death but in reality, her core would be recreated by the universe's heart again after billions of years. This process would consume so much celestial energy, that it would dry up their entire kingdom for billions of years to come. No, the prophecy has emphasized that we keep our hands to ourselves. The first ruler rejected his suggestion. But, the moment we decided to place our full faith in the prophecy, it meant following its instructions to the letter regardless of the outcome. 
The first ruler doubled down as he glanced at the massive invisible tablet above them. There weren't any other instructions or predictions of what was going to happen besides trusting the pivotal moment regarding Asna's seal. However, the outcome, the pitch black gate at the very top of the tablet remained unchanged, which made them understand that they were on the right path. Thus, even when they were betting the entire future of the kingdom, the three rulers remained motionless and observed the next scene. An explosion that had the same power as a nuclear bomb went off in the hall, destroying nothing but Jaden's bones and Kathy's corpse. The moment this happened, the three rulers picked up on the awakening of a powerful force at the depth of the same galaxy. When they changed their senses to it, they witnessed Cronus pulling a fragment of what was left off Asna and Felix's souls merged into one. Cronus? What is he doing? The second ruler murmured in confusion. Still, no instructions, I guess landing in his hands is a part of the pro, what the hell is he doing? Before the third could finish his sentence, his eyes widened in shock as he observed him throw the wisp into his humongous pitch black eye. Ruumble. The instant the wisp went inside his eye, a thunderous clap echoed across the entire universe, resembling the sound of cosmic gears grinding to a halt. Then, a visible shockwave emanated from Cronus, spreading outwards at an unimaginable speed, reaching every corner of the universe. As it passed, every star, planet, and creature froze in place. The entire universe was cast into a suspended temporal state, a still frame captured by none other than the guardian of space and time. Above this frozen tableau, the three rulers observed the universe pause under Cronus's command with a mixture of emotions. This, this, bastard, he dared to abuse his laws and sent Asna into a different frozen timeline. The three rulers didn't seem shocked by the sight of the frozen universe, but more by Cronus' decision to make such a command. They knew that there were infinite frozen timelines in the matter universe with each one affixed at a very specific moment in time, either in the past, present, or the far future. The only one with control to switch between those timelines was Uranus and the consciousness of the universe. As for the reason they weren't affected, they existed in one of the universe's natural dimensional realms and also due to their social status. Eternal Kingdom, Void Realm, Quantum Realm, and the Spirit Realm, everything in these realms was unaffected by any temporal changes occurring in the matter universe. Thus, the moment Cronus sent Felix and Asna twenty years into the past, he sent them into a frozen timeline, which was activated from its static state the moment they entered it. This made it the present universe for everyone while the previous one was sealed shut instead. Since this was tampering with the universe's balance, even the ones with time immunity in the matter universe had no clue what happened and continued living their lives as normal, not knowing that a parallel version of themselves was frozen in the future in a different timeline. In simpler terms, everything in the universe was under temporal manipulation besides the unigens and the natural realms, making them the only constant nails in its eternal existence. Speaking about them, such a drastic change couldn't escape the eyes of the other unigens, making them all converge in the council hall. Why did Cronus switch the timelines? Did something happen? Artemis inquired with a serious tone. Mother Fasterisker, I just found a new superstar in the SG platform. Now, I have to wait twenty years until he joins. Apollo cried out loud in frustration. Don't tell me Cronus has erased his memories again and did this by mistake. Poseidon frowned. Even Lilith and Lord Hades picked up on the change in the timeline while it felt like nothing happened. While Lord Hades was clueless and couldn't care less, focusing purely on guarding his spirit realm, a sinister smile broke on Lilith's face as she hid in the darkness of the void. The beginning of the end has finally arrived. She murmured, her eyes displaying a terrifying level of foresight. While each had their own thoughts about this development, their senses were affixed on Cronus, the source of this upheaval. When they saw his slumbering body get assaulted by more than 10,000 celestial chains, chills coursed down their spine. A fitting punishment for such a monumental abuse of laws. Why the hell did he do it? This thought roamed across their minds, but no one besides Cronus could answer it. 1788 Can you handle the truth? 4. 
Time passed and life in the matter universe and its neighboring realms continued on without much of a change. The only ones, who knew about the change in the timeline, were told the whole story about Felix and Asna. Many of them became interested in their newly merged soul and their mortal journey, including Artemis, Apollo, and Eris, especially, when they found out that Felix someone had full control over his body and soul instead of Asna. This revelation had given birth to a whole new discussion, a decision about Felix's true identity as none of them were dumb enough to believe he was a mere mortal. After so many theories were debunked, we are left with only one that can explain this insanity, Athena uttered with a solemn tone within the confines of the Celestial Council. The three rulers and many other Unigens were seen sitting in their respectful chairs, giving their full attention to Athena. He must be the lost consciousness of the universe. Nothing else can explain this many coincidences. The lost consciousness? Let's not get ahead of ourselves and start putting labels. Poseidon shook his head, just like there are many details that allude to the mortal being the lost consciousness of the universe, there are also many other points negating it. He is right. Aeolus added with a big yawn, how can the consciousness of the universe associate itself with one of the weakest life forms in the universe? Humans die by the tens of millions each day for various reasons. Indeed, if it wasn't for Cronus' interference, he would have died right there and then. Hephaestus scoffed, I refuse to believe that the almighty consciousness of the universe will make such a poor choice and embed itself with a human, knowingly he will lose his memories and omnipotence. A dragon would have made more sense, to be honest. Many Unigens found it tough to accept Felix being the consciousness of the universe even when they knew that the universe could possess his body. In their eyes, it made no sense, it was like choosing an ant as a host instead of a lion and then hoping to survive the brutal life of the jungle. I get it, there are too many points that make no sense. Athena defended her dispute strongly, but, how do you explain all of this? A random human from a race that breeds like insects stumble upon ruins where Asna is sealed. Instead of dying instantly, his soul synchronizes with Asna to perfection, and when they get sent to a peril version of himself in the past, he is the one in full control of the body. This is Asna we are talking about, her core was still with her for God's sake. I doubt even we can put her on the bench if our souls were to match. She paused after seeing everyone having deep frowns in confusion seemingly trying their best to make sense of this, but to no avail. Admit it, no matter how much you try to avoid it, you always come back to one explanation. Athena uttered, her eyes narrowing in focus, his consciousness must be a higher grade than Asna's. In this universe, Asna's consciousness was on equal terms with the three rulers' reawakening, which meant only the universe's consciousness could override her authority. I am not saying this explanation isn't the most fitting in this narrative. But, we have already scanned his consciousness and soul, they turned out to be plain mortal ones. Zeus addressed with a regal voice, how do you explain that? This was one of the points that killed off Athena's theory. It was very easy to check a soul's grade and identity for beings like them. They had already done their due diligence while Felix was busy building his hotel in the Sky Pearl Island having no clue about any of this. Besides Asna's overbearing weakened consciousness, there wasn't anything unique about it. Come on, this is the universe's consciousness we are talking about, I doubt he will have difficulty mimicking a mortal's consciousness to perfection. Athena expressed. You are reaching. Poseidon shook his head again, based on the same concept, the universe's consciousness shouldn't bother to go through this much length for anything. He already has omnipotence to do as he pleases. Why leave the universe without a consciousness to guide it? If he seeks to relieve his boredom, he can keep his main consciousness to rule the universe while sending out wisps to experience mortal life and whatnot. Indeed, if I had his omnipotence, I would never let go of it, Hephaestus uttered with a fierce desire. I don't know, but I still. You guys are missing a very important key point. Apollo suddenly interrupted Athena while causally playing with the lyre in his lap. Apollo, say what you have. Athena gave him an irritated look, but she didn't rebuke him for the disrespectful interruption. 
All of us assume that the universe used to have a consciousness since we were born out of the universe's heart and have gained consciousness and personalities based on our origins. He gazed at them like he was staring at idiots and said, But, you should never forget that we have no evidence about its existence in the first place. So, all of this bickering and arguments are for naught. While his presentation was punchable, no one managed to collect a retort. His point was valid as no one really had any concrete evidence for the universe possessing a consciousness. They theorized its existence due to its unique birth and the loopholes left in the universe's balancing system, which made it seem like it was following the orders of someone or something. Plus, it made a ton of sense for the universe to have consciousness when considering that the Unigens and even the three rulers could get punished if they abused their powers. If the three rulers were the apex and supreme entities in the universe, there shouldn't be an instant punishment if they dared to step inside the matter universe. But still, all of these were mere assumptions based on logical reasoning instead of trusting valid evidence. Thus, it was indeed foolish to argue about Felix's identity when they never had proof that the universe used to possess consciousness before their birth. To me, Asna makes the most sense in being the consciousness of the universe. Apollo shrugged his shoulders at their silence. Doesn't this prove that the mortal has a connection to the universe one way or another? Otherwise, how can anything explain what we witnessed? Athena sighed hopelessly, feeling like they were running in circles. Again, I tell you, it's impo. That's enough. Before Poseidon could attack her point, the first ruler intervened at last. Everyone lifted their heads and gave him their full attention. We are clearly lacking some vital information or we are missing something in plain sight. The first ruler said calmly, whatever it is, there is no benefit in discussing this anymore. Then, what do you suggest? Hephaestus frowned, do we just ignore them and proceed living our lives? Exactly. The first ruler added, the prophecy tablet's new instructions made it clear we need to keep our distance from them. I faith that the truth will come out on its own. Trusting that wicked tablet again. Poseidon warned with a deep gaze, I tell you, that tablet is going to be the death of us. I don't know why, but it feels too eerie to follow its instructions. Death? Ha, coward much. Hephaestus sneered, no one and nothing can kill a unigen when our rebirth is linked to the universe's heart. I don't know about the death part but I am also with Poseidon on this one. Artemis said softly, after these latest developments, it does kind of feel creepy following its instructions blindly. What if the universe's consciousness created the tablet and used it to help him resurrect himself? Aren't we aiding our slave master reborn? 1789 Can you handle the truth? V. It's a calculated risk. The first ruler brushed it off like it was never an issue. The three rulers were not foolish to miss such a hypothesis. They knew from the beginning that the prophecy tablet could be a trap placed by the universe's consciousness to help him emerge again. The fact that they couldn't gaze into the future in matters related to the prophecy was another note backing this assumption. After all, the universe could create a prophecy tablet, but it shouldn't be possible to block peeking into their future. Such a decision took intelligence and the universe had none at the moment or when the prophecy tablet first appeared. A calculated risk, hey. Poseidon shook his head. He knew that nothing they said could change the three rulers' attitude. In their eyes, the prophecy tablet was the only way out of their prison. They had already tried every other method to no avail. This left them with only two choices either trust the prophecy tablet or accept their eternal imprisonment. Tisk, your concerns have no merit. Uranus scoffed coldly as he gazed at the screen showing Felix watching alien movies with his grandfather Robert. He was using his idiotic plan to prepare him for the upcoming Alexander Kingdom invasion and avoid having a heart attack. Look at him, look. If this is the universe's consciousness attempt to reborn itself, then it will fall flat face without us doing anything. I give him a year. A year and we will find his corpse thrown in some ditch. The Unigen's eyelids twitched, not able to find a retort, young Felix wasn't making it any easier to place faith in him with his decision-making skills. 
Also, if we considered the rebirth theory as real, this poses a much more serious question. Demeter interjected with a stern tone, if the universe's consciousness went this far to ensure its rebirth, then, doesn't this mean that its death wasn't voluntary? When this notion was brought up, many Unigens raised their eyebrows in surprise. You mean he was killed? By who? Who is strong enough to kill the most omnipotent being in the universe? The creator of all life and harbinger of death. Maybe someone from the other side. Zeus narrowed his eyes at the universe's heart, for all we know, our universe isn't alone. There might be infinite universes and our creator fought against their invasion and died protecting our universe. He locked us up for our safety while he tried to revive himself and claim his throne again. If this theory is correct, then, maybe the stone of reality is the real universe's heart. Eris joined in the discussion with a deep response, we might have failed to bring back the stone of reality, but I have run some studies on it and those cracks on its surface resemble wounds. Considering that the universe's authority can be somehow matched by it, then it does seem like a valid theory. Athena held her chin thoughtfully as she gazed at the tiny white dot, though, if we considered that the stone of reality is the universe's heart, then what makes this one? The Unigens were left pondering in silence, feeling somewhat lost with all of those theories thrown in their faces that somehow made sense, but at the same time didn't. First, Felix was the consciousness of the universe. Second, the universe's consciousness might be using the tablet to lure them into reviving him. Third, the stone of reality was the true heart of the universe and was wounded after a battle with the outer gods. Every theory had its logical merits but at the same time, some facts denied its validity. As I said, don't brew your minds over this. The first ruler said calmly, the truth will come out when the time is right. Dismissed. Back to the present. Felix and the tenants were left staring at each other in stunned stupor. The memories orb had ended with the meeting being dismissed. Most of them felt relieved about it as their minds and hearts couldn't handle everything that was shown, especially, Felix. Seeing Felix's unfocused deadpan look, Eris asked calmly, What do you think? Felix broke out of his daze after hearing her voice, he lifted his head and requested with a husky soft voice, Give me a moment to recollect my thoughts. Eris refocused on her book and kept reading it in silence, giving him all the time he needed. She knew that he received multiple shocks from the memories. Even if Felix had a strong will and could handle many things, it wasn't easy to overlook those truths. He always assumed that his meeting with Asna was a chance and their rebirth was an unexplainable blessing. Yet, to find out that he was saved by Cronus and that the three rulers had allowed it to happen for the sake of following a peculiar tablet's instructions didn't sit well with him. It made him feel like his entire life was a lie and the only reason he was still alive was due to a piece of rock he never knew existed. The worst part, he knew the memories were real. If they were tampered with, he would have figured it out instantly. Felix. Candace reached out with her hand, wanting to comfort him. While the tenants were also shocked by the information, none of them were hit as hard as Felix. Don't, I am good. Felix halted her attempts with a hand while using the other to massage his right temple, relying on his water and ice laws to chill his emotions, countering the rising fierceness of fire laws. If he hadn't detached himself from the seven sins, he would have already gone berserker. Are you sure? Lady Yggdrasil checked on him with a gentle voice. I have gone through worse. Felix nodded with a forced smile. Felix. Sigh. When the tenants saw his forced smile, some of them felt their hearts ripping apart in anguish and empathy. How could they not empathize with him? He had yet to recover from being manipulated by Lilith. While it turned out to his benefit, he never forgave her and would never do so. Now, he found out that his entire journey was being watched by the three rulers from his previous life and manipulated by a prophecy. The sense of having a free choice was no longer there. Felix lifted his head and asked Eris, I wonder, did the three rulers send me to the spirit realm because of that tablet too? You already know the answer, Eris responded. 
Felix showed a bitter smile and kept the rest of the questions to himself. He realized that any move the three rulers had created regarding him must be related to the tablet. Don't sell yourself too short. Eris tried to uplift him, the moment you stepped into the Eternal Kingdom, nothing was predicted by the tablet besides a snizz core landing in the three rulers' hands eventually. This means you have genuinely given them a operate for their money. Be proud of it. She chuckled. Unfortunately, Felix didn't find it funny as the moment he heard the last part, his expression turned frigid and menacing all of a sudden. A snizz core landing in their hands? Over my dead body. He uttered coldly. While the idea of his entire life being led by a set of instructions created him feel sick to his stomach, he would never allow this prediction to occur. He had gone through so much bullsh asterisk t to protect Asna's core and rescue her from the three rulers, he denied to fail near the finish line even when all of the tablet's predictions flipped out to be true. First, you have to go through me. Eris uttered calmly, maybe, I am the one who will be handing her core to them. 1790 The Battle of Trust I Not in this lifetime. Felix sneered. It's best not to underestimate me. Eris smiled as she pushed her glasses up her nose bridge, I might have chosen your side, but I have no interest in pulling back in our battle. If you can't even afford to defeat me at my peak, you don't deserve to stand before Ares or the three rulers. I will make sure you are pleasantly satisfied with my prowess, Felix uttered one word at a time with a suppressed tone. I do hope so. I am betting everything in you to show me the full truth. Eris replied solemnly. Felix recognized the pressing hunger for the truth from her eyes, making him understand at last, how Eris was able to live with her decision to hand off her core. She couldn't care less about remaining at the top of the pyramid if a chance to find out the truth about the universe presented itself. The full truth, does it have relation to me being the consciousness of the universe? Felix narrowed his eyes, I have seen the memories. Most of the Unigens were rejecting that idea. So, how come are you 99% sure? They were uncertain because you were a human, young, and weak. Eris replied calmly as she sized him up, haven't you seen yourself lately? You have ascended five times and can do it two more times, and probably even three times if you find a way to bypass the heart's dilemma. You are in control of more than 24 laws and I am certain your strength should be closing up on the 100 million mark after all of those ascensions. You can control peculiar black celestial flames that no one else could and can even use celestial white flames too. You are the closest thing to a celestial in terms of potential and I am certain you will become one with time. Celestials can't be grown, but only birthed. This means you were born with the potential to become one. So, tell me, do you still believe yourself to be of a mere mortal birth? Eris shook her head, if you were, you wouldn't have made it this far. With all of those things brought up and highlighted, there was no way for Felix or the tenants to lie to themselves anymore. Whether Felix was the universe's consciousness might be debatable, but it would be foolish to deny it completely. I am afraid to say that she has a point. Lord Marduk remarked, I may not have joined you from the very start of your journey and can't comment on all of your struggles, however, the fact you have climbed this far is beyond a miracle. It's true. Lord Loki supported, even if we put another mortal in your position and he went through your struggles, he won't make it this far. He has to have the secret sauce, and I am certain it has relations to celestials. In other words, no one disparaged Felix's achievements or the insanely hard work he put into his journey to climb this far. However, if it wasn't for the many unexplainable phenomena related to him, he would have failed a long time ago. The best example was the celestial white slash black flames. If he wasn't able to control them he would have never beaten Hephaestus or emerged alive from the spirit realm. If it wasn't for Asna merging with his soul, he wouldn't have had the potential to become a primogenitor or a unigen. The list goes on about many cheats at his disposal concerning celestial matters. This made Felix understand that no matter how hard he tried to reject or close an eye on the truth, he was associated with the Celestials one way or another. 
Before he could open his mouth and bring out this matter, Eris shared with a knowing look, you are thinking that you can be a celestial like the three rulers instead of the consciousness of the universe. Felix nodded in silence. There was a huge difference between a celestial and the consciousness of the universe. Even Asna was still considered a mere celestial pre-awakening. No one knew for sure if she would turn into the consciousness of the universe after awakening or just a more powerful celestial. This is what the majority of the Unigens and probably even the three rulers believe too. Eris remarked calmly, but not me, I have been working tirelessly to find out the truth while they were waiting for it to show up on its own. After I have seen your reaction to the stone of reality, I am more positive than ever about my theory. What is it? Felix narrowed his eyes. Instead of answering, Eris closed up her book and uttered with a faint smile, There is no point in telling you if you lose before me since it will invalidate it. Eris stood up slowly, her entire demeanor and aura changed to a murderous executioner. Then, she said, If you want to know, prove me right. I guess you're right. Nothing will matter if I die under your hands. Felix stood up as well, he had heard and seen more than enough to make him understand that his true identity was an enigma for even the three rulers. If he wanted to know more and actually find proof for all of those speculations, there was only one path, forward. How do you desire to play this? Felix inquired indifferently, all out with law's abuse or not. Do as you observe fit, Eris replied calmly. Say less. Without further ado, Felix cancelled his clone and switched his focus to his main body. He was still standing in front of the gate, having no interest in throwing a lowball at Eris by ambushing her. She created it clear that she still didn't trust his capabilities to take down the three rulers and assist her discover the truth. He would prove her correct if he failed to take her down without sneak attacks. You got this, Thor assured him with a stern tone. The rest of the tenants provided encouraging remarks as well as they watched him take a deep breath, focusing his powers to make a crucial wish. I wish for immunity from the bindings of chaos and order, just for five seconds. The air around him glistened as his wish took hold, creating an invisible skin-tight protective bubble that nullified the chaotic fluctuations and ordered patterns affecting the area. Felix, we have no more void creatures to sacrifice for wishes. Candace warned him after switching focus to her main consciousness, finding out that their entire armies were devoured. I understand. Felix narrowed his eyes coldly, five seconds is enough to decide the victor. Without an ounce of hesitation, Felix extended his palm forward and commanded, Manifest, the all-devouring gravitational puppet. A new massive black sigil manifested high above with many intricate and complex inscriptions on it. From the heart of the sigil, a gigantic puppet emerged. It had elongated limbs and a hauntingly empty face, except for the gaping maw at its center. At the depth of this maw, a small black hole formed, stirring ominously. This was the same puppet Felix had used before to store the soul explosion energy of Zeus and Poseidon before releasing it at the Eternal Kingdom. The only difference was the addition of the small black hole as Felix had used Uranus gravity laws to merge with the puppet, giving birth to a new more powerful monstrosity. As soon as it fully materialized, the puppet extended its arms, reaching toward the celestial anomalies and the chaotic landscape around it. The black hole in its stomach acted as a singularity of insatiable hunger, beginning to pull at the very fabric of the floor's reality, causing the floating sea of liquid fire to distort stretching towards the puppet as if drawn by an invisible thread. Even the split star began to crumble at its edges, failing to fight against the powerful pull inside the puppet's stomach. The bizarre, non-spherical celestial bodies were not spared either, drifting closer, their orbits decaying under the unyielding pull of the black hole. It's not budging, no wonder the upper unigens failed to retrieve it. Felix murmured as he watched the stone of reality remain affixed in its position even under the constant pull of a technique capable of devouring soul explosions in an instant. Whatever, I will deal with it later. Soon, Felix switched his focus back to the emptied massive area of the floor, leaving nothing behind but a piece of void and the stone of reality. Now, 
there are no more chaotic elements to be used against me and I have devoured all types of energies on the floor. Felix narrowed his eyes coldly as he gazed at the slowly floating Eris in his direction. When Eris observed what he did, she didn't seem bothered or phased. She kept moving forward until a decent distance was between them. Then, she opened her book and uttered calmly, by the laws of order, restore the floor back to its original condition. 1791 The Battle of Trust 2. The moment her declaration resounded with the authority of the cosmos, the puppet began to shudder, its form contorting unnaturally as if struggling against the very nature of its creation. Then, before anyone could react, the puppet started to hurl everything it had consumed without Felix's orders. The chaotic elements it had absorbed were forcefully expelled and launched back onto the floor. Stop! Felix attempted to countermand with his own commands, trying desperately to regain control, but Eris's commands overpowered his, her authority was absolute. This was the true terror of the laws of order. It represented the order of the universe, which had control and balance over all of its laws. In other words, its authority supersedes all of the other laws, regardless of their owners. As expected, it isn't going to be easy. Still, Felix wasn't disappointed as he had already anticipated this much. Recognizing Eris's superior control, Felix quickly moved to plan B of his strategy. Implode. He ordered the puppet, directing it to self-destruct near Eris in a last-ditch effort to disrupt her composure. This time, the puppet listened to Felix's command since it had no relation to the laws of order. Eris could affect anything that disturbed the order of matter, but she could not use it to gain control over other Unigen's powers whenever she desired. Realizing that the explosion was inevitable, Eris didn't bother to stop it. She waved her hand and shielded herself with a barrier empowered with radiant-slash-resplendent divinity. Boom. However, as soon as the implosion occurred, Felix didn't wait for it to fail at dealing any damage to Eris. He raised his hands, summoning one of his latest most powerful symbolic techniques. A massive dark colorful sigil manifested right in the center of the explosion. It had more complicated inscriptions than the all-devouring gravitational puppet. The moment Eris read the writings on the sigil, she instantly figured out what kind of laws were mixed in to create it. Gluttony, radiation, plasma, antimatter, and void laws. She raised an eyebrow in surprise, what kind of technique is this? She was soon about to find out as the boar at the center of the sigil opened its mouth wide and began to suck in the explosion's energy like there was no tomorrow. In almost no time, the entire released energy was absorbed before it could even reach Eris or Felix. Without any delay, Felix aimed the symbolic sigil at Eris and shouted, Death Ray. An ominous terrifying dark ray with a colorful hue burst forth from the sigil with an uncanny speed. As it streaked across the battlefield, it cut through anything before it like a blade, its path illuminated by a creepy, sinister trail. Eris seemed unfazed as she observed the approaching demise with an unreadable expression. However, even she realized that her powerful barrier would struggle immensely against its destructiveness. It would stop because it was empowered with divinities, but it would require a massive quantity to achieve it. Still, instead of avoiding it, she decided to take it on by invoking another ability. Chaotic Reversal With a graceful motion, she manifested a translucent chaotic mirror in front of the death ray. The instant it went through it, the death ray halted abruptly and twisted at a 90-degree angle, redirecting towards the stone of reality positioned above them. Before Felix could react to her impeccably laid free counter, the redirected death ray collided with the stone of reality. The ancient stone convulsed violently under the assault but suffered from absolutely no damage whatsoever. However, it did not welcome the thought of being touched in the slightest. Instantly, its surface began to react, widening the pre-existing cracks. Then, it released a thick miasma like a flood breaking through a dam. The atmosphere around the stone thickened as the miasma spilled into the environment, rushing everywhere. The moment it gripped the residual energy from the death ray, it triggered a series of surreal transformations within the miasma itself. 
What began as a formless fog soon morphed into bizarre, illogical objects and phenomena. Skyscrapers, towering and architecturally impossible, commenced to rise from the miasma, their structures twisted and looping in ways that defied physical laws. Broken stars materialized next, their cores still burning with a cold fire. There was even the emergence of black holes. Instead of sucking in the matter, it expelled the miasma at unprecedented speed, helping it cover more ground. I advise you not to come into contact with the miasma, Eris warned in good faith as she pulled away from the peculiar mist. It was clear that the miasma could alter the reality of anything interacting with it. Since the Stone of Reality's authority was higher than Unigen's, if it gripped them, their fate would not be pleasant in the slightest. Worry about yourself. Not needing a warning, Felix chased after her with his phasing ability, not wanting to waste the duration of his immunities. Seeing that she was being chased, Eris turned around and waved her hand gracefully, releasing a chaotic wave in his direction. Felix charged through it with narrowed eyes, his immunites helping him remain unharmed. Immunities, hey! Eris replied calmly, how many seconds do you have left? Enough. Before Felix's voice could reach her ears, he manifested next to her and tried to pierce her with an invisible vibrational sword. It might not seem like much, but this sword had its frequency tuned to disturb any frequency it gripped at the lowest level possible. One could say it was a downgraded version of matter execution. With an unbothered expression, Eris allowed the sword to pierce through her chest. Before Felix could celebrate, Eris gazed at him straight in the eyes and shared indifferently, it's good that you haven't used matter execution. Such attacks are useless against me. Felix's expression turned for the worse after realizing that his sword failed to disturb her frequency, no matter how hard he tried, her frequency was like a solid wall. Have you ever wondered why Uranus doesn't dare to fight me? Most vibrational attacks rely on disturbing the order of matter, atmosphere, or even the strings. But, how can you disturb the embodiment of order? She uttered coldly as she tapped into her chaotic laws and caught the vibrational sword with her own bare hand. Before Felix could react or release the sword, Eris snapped her finger and expanded an invisible sphere from her book around them. SH asterisk T. The moment Felix sensed its existence, he tried to run away by phasing out. However, he found out to be under the same experience he put Uranus. The sphere was disturbing the frequencies around him, making it impossible to match his frequency with another plane. Since it was affecting the frequencies in the area and not him, his immunities were useless against it. But, unlike Uranus, he had other options. God's speed. His entire body was suddenly set ablaze in energized golden lightning for a nanosecond and then, he turned into a lightning bolt and bounced away. Eris didn't try to give a chase, knowing that he was the one strapped for time. The moment his immunities expire, the real fun would begin for her. Felix knew that it would get X10 more difficult to handle her without his immunities. After all, upper celestial unigens were never meant to kill each other. His success with Uranus relied on the tower's authority to make it happen and he could not repeat the same dance here. As for having a Sna's core devour hers? The moment a Sna's core would try to pull her core out, Eris would easily snap the connection with her twisted laws. He needed a good setting to ensure that wouldn't happen, but he knew it would be impossible to achieve it without abusing his laws. No, I refuse. Felix hardened his expression. Abusing my laws is the last option. Felix didn't want to rely on abusing his laws after every inconvenience. After all, the three rulers' strength was too overwhelming without them needing to abuse their celestial powers. How could he take the three of them while chained up? I understand Eris' test now. Elder Crocken remarked with a solemn tone, she is playing it slow, wanting to see what can Felix do without abusing his laws. Indeed. It's not looking well. Thor frowned, he has prepared many strategies, but her laws are just too overwhelming at breaking them down. This is enough to tell you that quantity isn't always best with laws. Chaos breaks things apart while order restores them. With her authority superseding over Unigens, 
those two qualities are enough to deal with any threat. Lady Sphinx commentated as she watched Felix split into seven versions of himself, speeding across the entire floor, and assaulting her from every possible direction. However, regardless of what attack he used, and what law he tapped into, nothing was good enough to touch or make her even flinch. She is genuinely league apart from other Unigens. Candace murmured with a tint of awe. If she is this omnipotent, how frightening is Ares? Thor gulped audibly. 1792 The Battle of Trust 3. Time is ticking. Eris waved her finger left and right as she watched Felix's seven clones inhaling roughly. They surrounded her from seven sides and each one had a few sigils and symbols above their heads. Yet, none of them proved to be useful against her. That's because she had utilized a new defensive technique called the Law of Retribution. This created a zone where a strict set of rules were imposed, ensuring that any attack would have a proper countermeasure. With the addition of the Order Cancellation Technique and Divinities, it was nearly impossible to penetrate through her defenses. If you want to win, you know exactly what to do. Lilith reminded with a faint playful smirk. No, it might end horribly for both of us. Felix knitted his eyebrows in disapproval after being reminded of another option he had left. An option with no relation to law abuse, but it was just as deadly. I have taught you how to enter and leave it. Lilith encouraged him with a seductive voice, if you don't go for it, you might as well abuse your laws right now. I can't believe I am agreeing with her, but she is right. Hormongondra advised with a stern tone, you don't have time to think about a new strategy. Also, you barely have enough celestial energy for a single attack. Felix remained silent, his seven brains working overtime to find a new path, an opening in her defenses, but no matter how hard he tried or what combination of laws he used, nothing came back positive. Without abusing his laws, Eris was simply untouchable, unless... She is currently untouchable because she is tapping into her order embodiment, giving her the authority to supersede all laws. Felix narrowed his eyes coldly, unless I did the same, I can't contest against her without abusing my laws. Damn it, I hate when that which is right. Felix's expression turned for the worse after realizing that Lilith had taught him the next stage of sin's control to witness him using it against Eris. If it's the only way to victory, so be it. Many years ago, within the void inside the echoing tower, we have come up with a good plan to deal with either Uranus or Eris inside the twentieth floor. But, after taking one of them down, what am I supposed to do against the other? Felix had a deep frown as he sat at the central table with his council. He understood that the twentieth floor was going to do the bulk of the fight for him due to the Stone of Reality's absolute authority. But, he wouldn't have the same advantage when dealing with the remaining Unigen, whether it was Eris or Uranus, none of them would be easy to take down on other floors. How about you use your evil energy again to gain control over the Stone of Reality? Fenrir suggested with a cold face, if you succeeded, the entire tower would be under your authority. Instead of answering him, Felix and the others turned to Lilith, who was sunbathing in her usual spot. Don't waste your time. I tried it and failed. Lilith answered lazily. As expected. Felix wasn't too surprised. He knew that if evil energy had such an authority to overtake the stone of reality, Lilith would have already used it against Asna's core. Such celestial treasures were immune to evil energy since it was merely the personification of Lilith's wickedness born into energy. This was Felix's theory about its origin. Just like she was able to detach her sin's embodiments, she could detach her evilness and turn it into energy. The only reason he could control his evilness was probably due to this separation. After all, evil entities knew nothing about boundaries and had no issues with massacring the entire universe just for their own amusement. But, Felix never had such a thought. Well, I really don't see a way for you to succeed in trapping one of them on the other floors unless you abused your laws. Elder Crocken shook his head, even then, it's doubtful if it will work when they can also abuse their laws. This was the dilemma Felix was facing. He knew it was a big risk to abuse his laws. 
After all, if he failed, he would be chained up on the first floor. While he could establish the connection to the twentieth floor easily with a wish through manipulating the fluctuations of the first floor's portal, it was still a massive risk. Ah, uh, dealing with upper celestial unigens is too complicated. Candace sighed in frustration. The rest of the tenants fell in deep silence, each one putting their minds into brewing the best possible strategy to help Felix. At least fifteen brains were functioning on this and yet, no one managed to devise a decent plan that didn't involve abusing the laws. When Lilith saw how everyone was left stumped for answers, a faint smirk emerged on her lustrous violet lips. You know, there is another stage unexplored to being a unigen. Lilith broke the silence, her voice was neutral, but had a hidden tint of seduction in it. Felix spotted it immediately, which made him alert. He contracted his eyes and asked, What do you mean? How can there be another level? If there was, I should have seen it by now. Indeed, Felix had fought quite a few unigens and he had yet to notice any of them use something he hadn't anticipated. That's because not every unigen can tap into it. Lilith removed her sunglasses and manifested next to them with one leg above the other. Then she continued, Only I, Eris, Ares, Hades, and Cronus can use it. Wait, not even Uranus has it. Felix raised an eyebrow in surprise. Just because a unigen is part of the Upper Celestial Council doesn't mean we share the same strengths. She replied. Felix nodded, understanding that each Upper Celestial Unigens had their own peculiar powers and weaknesses. What is it then? We call it a level up, but in reality, it is a specific power up for a price. Lilith showed a faint sinister smile and said, Why do think I am feared across all realms and have even made the three rulers suffer a bit? Most of the tenants leaned closer, their heartbeats accelerating at the realization that Lilith was finally about to spill the tea about the true strength of the Paragon of Sins. When they heard about Lilith almost ruining the three rulers' plans, which forced them to banish her outside of the kingdom, they assumed that her strength should be over the top. But after Felix became the paragon of sins, he was struggling to deal with each unigen and that's when he had the help of other laws and new powerful techniques. So, this made them always wonder if Felix was just bad at being the paragon of sins or if this was the limitation of the seven sins laws and Lilith had just gotten lucky. First, you have to understand something. Lilith entered her lecture mode, Unigens are the embodiment of the universe's laws. In other words, having control over a law implies tapping into the universe's authority. Yes, I already know this. Then, do you know this? Lilith showed a devious smile as she hurled a bombshell at them, the seven sins are not mere laws representing the seven sins of living forms, but the seven desires of the universe itself. Hey! You joking right? The universe's desires? It can't be. It would be a downplay to describe Felix and the tenants' reaction as a mere shock. They were legit at a loss for words, thinking that she was messing with them. Who could blame them? The general consensus was that the seven sins were laws based on living creatures and their desires instead of the universe itself. All laws are based on the universe itself without exception. Lilith remarked with a faint smirk. Being the paragon of sins implies you are the embodiment of the universe's seven desires and its evil side. What does this tell you? It can't be. Felix's eyes began widening slowly as he realized the significance of his next stage up. 1793 The Battle for Trust 4. It is. Lilith chuckled, as the universe's embodiment of its seven desires, you can supersede the authority of all laws since nothing could win against the corrupting desire of sins. Hearing her confirmation of his assumption, Felix's heartbeats accelerated to the limit in agitation. He understood that the universe operated under a complex system of laws, gravity, time, space, all types of energies, and whatnot. But what are these laws, if not manifestations of balance and order? And what was sin? if not the natural counter to such order. When Lilith saw that a few were still not caught up, she clarified with a faint smile, the seven sins, pride, envy, wrath, sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust, 
each challenge the universe's balance in unique ways. Pride defies submission, envy disrupts contentment, wrath counters peace, and so forth. The tenants nodded slowly, their minds racing as they connected the dots Lilith laid out before them. By fully embracing these sins, by becoming their embodiment, you don't just wield their individual powers, Lilith explained with a growing zeal. You embody the antithesis to the cosmic order. You become a being that can not only challenge but potentially override the fundamental laws that bind all things. Felix felt a surge of exhilaration, realizing that he was indeed not tapping into the full potential of his seven sins laws. The symbols and sin symbolic techniques are mere tools to tap into the universe's authority at a limited capacity, such as the equal trade symbol. Lady Sphinx added her own understanding on the matter with an intrigued voice, what Lilith suggested, is for you to become the true embodiment of those sins, embracing their gifts and faults. You mean if he became their embodiments, he wouldn't even need symbols or techniques to activate his powers. Doesn't this mean he will remove the limitations on his laws? Candace covered her mouth in shock at such an insane power-up. When it was put like this, most of the tenants had the same reaction, realizing the real reason for the universe putting limitations on some munigens. Lilith had to use the symbols to activate her powers. Eris had to use the Tome of Order and Chaos. Hades, Cronus, and Ares were unknown, but for them to be able to tap into this level up as well implied that they had their limitations too. Those limitations were imposed to give us the ability to use our laws but at the same time maintain our freedom of thought. The price was lowering the full extent of our reach with our laws due to how overwhelming and authoritative they were. Lilith continued, without those limitations, we will become the final form of our laws personality slash power wise. No wonder the universe hasn't placed any other limitations on the rest of the unigens. Even if they became their laws true embodiment, nothing much would change, since the upper celestials would override their laws authority. Elder Crocken said. Even Uranus wouldn't be able to stand up against Lilith, Eris, Ares, Cronus, and Hades if they were to embody their laws to their full extent like him truly. It wasn't anything about the Unigen, but the laws themselves. Wait a second, if all laws are embodiments of the universe, does this mean Hades is the universe's soul or consciousness? Felix suddenly frowned after spotting a hole in her narrative. In his eyes, if Hades was the embodiment of the universe's consciousness, he could override all other law embodiments if he wasn't punished with chains. Well, he is believed to be either the embodiment of the universe's soul vessel or at least its spiritual control over the spiritual matters in its realm. But, he isn't its consciousness itself. Lilith remarked calmly, that's something entirely different. I see. Felix nodded in understanding. He already knew that souls weren't the same as consciousness. Souls were shaped as spherical vessels with the consciousness lake within them. The consciousness lake, ocean, or whatnot, was the true consciousness of the living creatures. That's why it was possible to possess someone by getting rid of his consciousness and keeping his soul intact as long as there was perfect synchronization. Thus, it made the majority sense for Hades to be either the embodiment of the universe's soul vessel or its spiritual control instead of being its consciousness. If there is a soul vessel, doesn't this mean that the universe does indeed possess a consciousness? Lord Loki raised an eyebrow in surprise, feeling like this was enough for confirmation of this theory. Everyone believes this, but it won't be fully confirmed unless the universe's consciousness appears for real. Lilith answered. In other words, it was merely another lead that supported their theory. The only way to truly confirm it was if either Asna became the universe's consciousness after awakening or the universe manifested its own consciousness somehow. Back to the main point, to supersede the laws of the universe, you must not just use the sins. You must integrate them, let them transform you, and through you, reshape the universe on your desires. Lilith coughed softly, there is a catch though. Lay it on me. Felix narrowed his eyes, knowing that such a power-up could never come without a massive cost. Otherwise, Lilith would have told him about it a long time ago and not waited until he was desperate for solutions. Once you enter the true embodiment state, 
it will be extremely difficult to pull yourself from it. In the worst case scenario, the new embodiment would be your personality forever and you would lose your free will to act outside the boundaries of the chosen law embodiment. She said in one breath, softening her voice as much as possible to dilute such an outlandish side effect. The tenant's expressions had already turned bad, realizing the dangers of such power up being worse than the celestial chains. What is this crap? Absolutely not, you must not go for this. Cyclope warned with a solemn tone, it's more or less a death sentence to your life if you enter the true embodiment state using those wicked laws. He is right. Lady Sphinx supported, abusing your laws could come at a physical cost, but at least, you maintain control. What are you trying to pull here, you witch? Thor narrowed his eyes coldly at Lilith. I am not trying to pull anything. Lilith shrugged her shoulders, you wanted a new way to deal with your enemies and I told you about it. This is not a new method, it's a death sentence. No one approved it. It was an understandable stance considering that Felix might never be the same again, taking after a personality based on a sin. Whether it was pride, greed, gluttony, sloth, lust, envy, or wrath, all of those identities would have major defects to them since they were based on sins. Wait, let's hear her out. Felix halted their protest with one hand and asked calmly, what's the way to cope with the aftermath? Since Lilith had made it clear she entered that state to cope with the three rulers and managed to pull out of it, there must be a way to avoid being stuck in that state forever. It's simple, but not easy. Lilith switched to a more serious tone and disclosed, the only way out of that state is to fight for control by using a wisp unaffected by the true embodiment state. If you succeeded, you will regain your free will, but if you failed, well, I don't really need to tell you the outcome. 1794 The Battle of Trust V. Back to the present. If it's the only way to victory, so be it. Felix narrowed his eyes coldly, I will be forced to tap into this state sooner or later, might as well risk it here and now. When Felix and the tenants were told about the true embodiment state, it made them understand that it was an extremely dangerous procedure that might ruin Felix's life forever. However, Felix was still going for it if it meant avoiding law abuse. In his eyes, he must master this state before meeting with the three rulers. Otherwise, he would always be a mere unigen before a true celestial. The only reason he hesitated before to go for it was due to his friends, masters, and the tenants. He understood that even in his true embodiment state, he would seek to eliminate the three rulers and rescue Asna. But, it would not end well for the tenants as the moment one of them said the wrong thing or weirdly looked at him, it would be their end. He would have no control over it. Go for it and don't look back. Thor smiled, whatever happens, happens. Haha, <laughs> we are here for the journey not to hold you back. I don't care what happens to me as long as the three rulers and their lackeys can suffer once in their lifetime. Ancestral Dragon Immer laughed boastfully while joining them from a spiritual mirror connected with Felix's wisp in the ancestral sacred grounds. It would be a shame if we missed witnessing the end of your journey, the climax of this epic adventure, and learning the truths about the secrets of the universe. However, it would be even more detestable to be the ones holding you back from reaching your full potential. Hormongondra said with a strict tone, We have shared all our knowledge with you and we consider our purpose fulfilled, do not dwell on the past and go for it. Whether it was his masters or the other tenants, all of them supported Felix with their whole hearts and life if it had to be. Thus, regardless of what happened to them after Felix's transformation, none of them would have any regrets. In their eyes, it was already a blessing to be part of this miraculous adventure. Hearing their encouragement, a faint appreciative smile broke on Felix's face. No more words were needed as he straightaway committed to his decision. He narrowed his eyes at Eris and snapped his finger, making his clones merge back into one dot. When Eris saw this, she couldn't help but show a little knowing smile. About time. She said calmly, I was waiting for you to grow the courage to do it. I was wavering, confused, wanting to have it all, but no more. The moment he finished, Felix closed his eyes 
reaching for the detached sin of pride in his lion dragonic tail. With a deliberate intention, he called to it, summoning it forth with great desire. The sin pride responded, causing a surge of overwhelming energy to rush and fill every crevice of his being, eager to reclaim its rightful place within him. As the sin of pride reattached itself, Felix no longer fought against the overwhelming feeling of pride and arrogance attempting to take over his entity. Instead, he encouraged it, helped it and allowed it to consume his mind and body, not permitting him to have a single thought unrelated to his pride. This launched a magnificent transformation. Felix's wavy long hair, once a crimson red, gleamed and lightened into a brilliant golden hue, reflecting his newfound majesty. His eyes followed, turning a piercing shade of gold that seemed to glow with their own inner light. His entire demeanor shifted, his posture straightened, his shoulders squared, and his expression hardened into one of regal authority. This majestic transformation did not stop there. An undeniable aura of supremacy radiated from him, a compelling force of will that commanded recognition and obedience by anyone, anything, and all. Whoosh! This aura suddenly exploded outward, touching everything in its vicinity. It whispered of absolute power, of the sovereign right to command not just armies or nations, but the very laws of existence. When Felix opened his eyes, they were the eyes of a monarch. It wasn't of a mere mortal or even a unigen, but of the universe itself. His regal gaze swept across the first floor, causing every creature, celestial object, energy or even law to feel the irresistible authority of his presence. It was as if all life and even death itself should bow before him, and acknowledge his supremacy. When Felix's golden eyes locked onto the stone of reality, the celestial objects, and other levitating forms scattered across the first floor, he declared expressionlessly, let there be no doubt, nothing shall rise above me. The moment the words left his lips, they were not merely spoken, they were a mandate from a sovereign to his subjects, a creator to his creation, a god to his worshippers. From Felix, a powerful golden shockwave erupted, flowing upwards with irresistible force, striking the floating celestial bodies and entities, convulsing under the impact. Rumble. Rumble. Thud. One by one, they began to lose their buoyancy, falling from the sky like dead flies, unable to resist the pull of Felix's overwhelming command. Whether it was stars, block holes, moons, planets, floating oceans, or buildings, everything that was a mere inch above his head, fell into the void under him. The surprising part? Even the stone of reality listened to the command, not resisting it even once. Ka thumb. Ka thub. It thumped violently before being plucked from its position by the sheer force of Felix's command. Then, it tumbled end over end while releasing massive quantities of miasma. As it was falling in the background behind him Felix lowered his head slowly. This entire scene abandoned the tenants stunned and in disbelief, their eyes broadened to the boundary as they gazed at the whole sky of the first floor being cleared up, leaving only Eris and Felix standing face to face. Just as Candace was about to make a dazed comment, Lady Sphinx placed her hand on her mouth, silencing her instantly. Candace felt chills course down her spine after realizing that she almost killed herself. While Felix looked the same appearance-wise besides the change of eyes slash hair color, she knew that the moment any one of them spoke without permission could up executed. Before the regalness of the universe's pride, one could only lower his head and remain quiet to ensure their safety. Thus, the tenants kept their thoughts to themselves and gazed at Felix focusing back on Eris with an indifferent expression. He neither spoke nor did anything, he just kept staring at her with a deadpan gaze for less than two seconds, each second accompanied by a thundering heartbeat of the stone of reality. The moment the stone of reality quietened down, Felix cracked his stiffened neck and spoke nonchalantly, as an apology for using immunities, you are allowed to make the first move. How polite, I guess I will take you in your favor. Eris grinned as she opened her tome, by the way. I have been anticipating for you. Of course you were, who doesn't? Felix replied expressionlessly. 1795 The Battle of Trust 6. 
Eris chuckled at his comment momentarily before her entire demeanor instantly turned frigid. With a subtle motion of her hands, she cast a new technique called pattern recognition on Felix, causing unseen forces to tug at his movements and guiding him into committing to the highly predictable and familiar sequence of attacks. It was a clever manipulation, using Felix's own combat strategies against him by forcing him into a repetitive loop of actions that she could easily anticipate and counter. That's exactly what occurred as the moment Felix launched his new assault, Eris predicted his emerging openings and tried to take advantage of them. She had already prepared a spear of chaos that would transform matter randomly and hurled it at the exact location, where Felix would appear next. However, Felix's expression remained cool and unreadable, his golden eyes still locked onto hers. You genuinely think you can order me around? Me. Felix's voice cut through the tension, his tone laced with a cold amusement. Before Eris could respond, Felix raised his hand smoothly and commanded with chilling authority, Halt! Instantly, his body stopped all motion, freezing in place and breaking the cycle Eris had crafted, causing the Spear of Chaos to miss him by a wide margin. I am the embodiment of pride. Felix uttered indifferently, Nothing can order me around and no one can reject my orders. With that bold statement, Felix pointed his finger at Eris and ordered coldly, Kneel and accept your defeat. His command rang with a visible golden imperial pulse rushing towards Eris, forcing her into evading it at all costs. She understood that if she was touched by it, her pride would be consumed instantly, forcing her to abide by his orders. Seeing that she was putting distance between them, Felix didn't bother to chase after her. He remained in his spot and uttered calmly, I thought this was supposed to be a test of trust. Are you going to make it interesting or keep running away? Eris ignored his taunt and flipped a page from her tome, placing down her reality-bending dimensional cube in his location. She knew that Felix would be too proud to move and avoid it. As expected, Felix sensed the creation of the dimensional prison around him and yet, he kept gazing at it indifferently. The moment it was created, Eris joined inside with him and closed her book. Then, she stared into his eyes and said calmly, This is why pride is a sin. Too much will cause your downfall. The tenant's expressions turned for the worst at this development, never expecting that Felix would allow himself to get caught just because it was beneath him to dodge. Now, he was trapped with Eris in her own world, her own reality where she was the goddess and controller of all laws. That's what everyone thought, but not Lilith, a faint mocking smirk emerged on her lips as she continued sunbathing, not bothering to even watch the rest of the battle, already anticipating the final outcome. Meanwhile, Felix, who should be frightened to have his laws removed, didn't seem too bothered. His eyes roamed across his new reality nonchalantly before landing on Eris' face. It seems you are mistaken about one thing. He uttered one word at a time with a cold gaze, I am not the one trapped with you, you are the one trapped with me. The moment he finished, he extended his hands above his head and made a gesture of placing a crown gently on it. Immediately after, the air above him flickered with a gathering golden radiance. Then a magnificent crown materialized, floating majestically above Felix's head. As the crown settled above him, a wave of golden energy rippled outward, the ground itself seeming to acknowledge his supremacy. I command this ground, these laws, this reality, everything is mine. Felix proclaimed, his voice booming across the dimension with an authority that was both imperial and inevitable. How shameless, attempting to steal control from me in my own reality. Eris' expression turned stern as she attempted to strip the laws of pride from her reality, without pride, you are nothing. The order had affected everything in her reality, but when it reached Felix, it fell flat in its face as the crown of sovereignty shimmered gloriously, protecting its owner's authority. I can't override his authority even here. Eris raised an eyebrow in surprise. She always knew that the Seven Sins laws were immensely powerful at their peak potential, but she never thought she would lose against them in her domain. No wonder Eris managed to pull a fast one on the three rulers. Eris' smile widened a bit, now I am seeing hope. 
Eris always wanted to explore Lilith's laws closely, but she was too secretive about her powers, showing only what she wanted them to see. Thus, she was almost as ignorant about the strength of the Seven Sins as any other person. That's why she was waiting for Felix to enter his true embodiment state, wanting to see how he would perform at his peak. After all, if she took his side, their enemies would be the three rulers and she wanted to make sure that he had what it got to deal with them. At this moment, she wasn't disappointed. If this is just the embodiment of the pride sin, I can't imagine what will happen if he embodies the true laws of all seven sins at once. She thought, but first, he has to exit the embodiment state. Eris knew that entering the true embodiment state was the easiest part. Even though she could enter the true embodiment state of order and chaos whenever she desired, but she refused to risk losing her autonomy. Also, she wasn't sure if it was even possible to supersede his authority even if she went for it, the universe's pride was just too overbearing. I guess there is only one way to deal with him now. Knowing she was left without many options, Eris reopened her tome again and flipped the pages until she reached the middle. Then, she gently held a paper as she gazed at Felix deeply in his eyes. This is my last action, if you survive this, you can have my core and full support. Can have. Felix tilted his head with genuine confusion, you think I am desperate for your core? For your help? Eris, I don't need you, I don't need anyone. You should feel honored to be recognized under me. There is no we, there is only I. The tenants were left stunned and speechless, feeling like if his haughtiness carried on, this might end differently than any of them anticipated. Let's see how you fare against my matter transformation technique. Eris merely chuckled in response and immediately ripped the page apart. The moment the page disintegrated into light particles, a brilliant, chaotic beam raced across the dimension aimed directly at Felix. As always, Felix couldn't bother to dodge having an inner self-belief that he was untouchable, unbreakable, and that nothing could hurt him no matter what. He tanked the chaotic energy directly, striking him squarely in the chest. Felix glanced below at the chaotic energy attempting to seek into every nook and cranny with him. He could feel that it was desiring to transform him into a different entity entirely. If you thought it would be easier to deal with it, you are gravely mistaken. Eris uttered calmly, for this exact technique, I had to abuse my L.A. Scram! Before Eris could finish her sentence, Felix merely gave a cold gaze at the chaotic energy attempting to invade his body, and it got expelled as fast as it had gotten in. Watching this shocking sight, Eris' eyes widened a bit, not expecting that even abusing her laws would fail to break through his defenses. How? She asked, genuinely confused. The assault she used would have been able to turn even Uranus into a piece of dead stone as she believed that no amount of authority could supersede chaos. After all, it was the element of randomness in the universe. How? What explanation do you need besides knowing that it's me? Felix replied indifferently. I see. Eris chuckled faintly, realizing that Felix's absolute belief of being unaffected by anything in the universe would help him survive through anything. The only way to harm him was to break apart his self-belief. I know now how to deal with you, but it's already too late. Eris remarked as a couple of chains manifested out of nowhere and tightened their grasp on her. While the assault had failed, the universe couldn't care less, it punished the action itself instead of the aftermath caused by it. As Eris said, if it was any other unigen, they would not have been standing before her after getting hit by matter transformation technique. Felix manifested a golden throne and sat on it with one leg above the other, with the crown of sovereignty donning his head, he truly resembled the sole emperor of this universe. Then, he queried expressionlessly, do you accept defeat? I have observed enough. Eris smiled, yes. Good, now kneel and swear your allegiance to me. He commanded with a drop-dead serious expression. Eris knitted her eyebrows in displeasure. What if I don't? You don't want to know, Felix replied coldly. 1796 How to Reclaim Control? 
Most of the tenants had their expressions turned for the worse at the realization that Felix's proud persona was going to ruin his chances to recruit heiress. This was also one of the reasons Felix was hesitant at the start to enter the true embodiment state, knowing that whichever state he entered, its extremities might make the situation worse. All the tenants turned to Lady Sphinx and gave her head nods with solemn expressions. Understanding what they wanted, Lady Sphinx appeared next to Felix's mediating wisp in the plaza. Then, she woke him up with a single message. It's time. Felix's eyes snapped wide open the moment he heard her voice. With a serious expression, he lifted his head and gazed at what was happening outside. When Felix's pride persona caught his gaze, he gave one last warning to Eris, I have to deal with a lingering pest. When I am finished with him, I hope you will have made the right choice. Eris remained silent, knowing that the moment of truth was here. If Felix could reclaim control from his overbearing pride persona, then, she would have no more misgivings. If he failed, well, she would be left with no choice but to leave this place. Even while chained up, she still had a way to escape unharmed. This was the reason she never thoroughly feared either Felix or his pride persona. Can he do it though? Eris thought to herself with a deep frown, I understand he has chosen pride embodiment due to its overwhelming authority, but it is also one of the hardest personas to deal with. How will he regain control from someone with the most overbearing superiority complex in the universe? While it seemed almost impossible, Felix wouldn't have chosen the pride sin if he hadn't already prepared a great countermeasure to regain control. The moment Felix's pride persona manifested in the consciousness space, he found only Felix standing in front of him. The rest of the tenants were told to not even use their senses to pry on them, in hopes of not agitating him and getting themselves expelled. Felix's pride persona felt their fading presence in their houses, but he ignored them. He couldn't be bothered with some small fry. He turned to Felix and looked down at him with a disdainful grimace radiating superiority. I feel sick just by looking at you. He uttered coldly, how can I be in the same breath with a weak, cowardly, soft, little creature like you? Yes, 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 I genuinely feel the same. For a lowly unigen as me to share the same body as your highness is an absolute honor. Truly. Felix immediately bowed his head down with a sheepish weak smile lowering his status before his pride persona. At least you have some common sense to know your superior. Felix's pride persona softened his tone a bit, seemingly pleased with Felix's instant allegiance. Of course, of course, how wouldn't I know? Felix spoke with a starstruck look, the very first chance I had, I called you over to take control, knowing that your imperial presence alone is enough to deal with anything. The other six embodiments have nothing against you. Humph, you damn right they don't. Felix's pride persona sneered at the mention of his brothers and sister. I feel delighted to know that your greatness will now lead us against the tyranny of the three rulers. Felix smiled widely in delight, of course, there is still Apollo, Ares, rescuing Asna and other missions to deal with first, but I am certain your highness can deal with it swiftly and easily. Felix's pride persona frowned in displeasure, you think someone of my status will go running around for such mundane errands? Absolutely not. My apologies, I have overstepped my bounds. Felix immediately bowed his head in shame. I deal with only matters of utmost importance worthy of my presence. Felix's pride persona uttered indifferently, holding on to control in every instance is beneath me. Then, allow this lowly one to take away such an unworthy burden off your shoulders. Felix requested with a sincere voice. Is that so? Felix's pride persona chuckled softly, a sound that echoed ominously around them, making Felix flinch. You play to my sensibilities, he responded with a cold tone, but make no mistake, I see through your tactics. You flatter to deceive, to regain what you've lost. Unfazed, Felix dropped his act at once, his act of submission was nowhere to be seen. Although his tactics were seen through, he still stuck by it, however, without the act. Perhaps, he admitted, 
but consider this, a true leader knows when to lead and when to entrust others. What glory is there in overseeing the ordinary? Does not a king risk his crown by toiling in the dirt with commoners? The pride persona paused, contemplating Felix's words, his expression softened slightly. It is indeed more fitting for me to step back and intervene only in moments worthy of my attention. Prove to me, then, that you can handle the lesser challenges without sullying my legacy. With a graceful, almost theatrical gesture, the pride persona reached out, interacting Felix's forehead. I relinquish this, for now, he declared regally. Do not disappoint me, and cease being such a loser. As the persona faded into the background of Felix's mind, Felix felt the full weight of his personality return, along with control over his body. He opened his eyes to the real world, the sensations of battle rushing back to him along a slight sting from the pride persona's parting words. You have done it. So quickly? How? Eris raised an eyebrow in surprise after seeing the change in Felix's entire demeanor and aura. First, I apologize for what he has said. Felix sighed in relief, I knew he would be extreme in his interactions but not this much. Don't mind it. Eris wasn't bothered, tell me how you convinced him to hand you control back? Did you stroke his ego? That's the only solution I am seeing. Exactly. Felix nodded in agreement, I knew that fighting over control with him would do nothing but get me erased and everyone killed. Since pride was the dominant emotion within him to the point it forced him to make horrible decisions just not to wound it, I knew that stroking his ego would do the trick. He just can't resist it whether he figured out my tactics or not. Great work. Eris sighed bitterly, if only it was that simple for me too. Chaos and order, hey. Felix knew exactly what she was talking about. His seven sins were powerful at their true embodiments, but due to their extremities, there was some leeway to gain back control. However, it was different for Eris. If she chose a true chaos embodiment state, she would lose control and due to its extremely chaotic nature, there was no possible way to regain her control unless her chaotic embodiment decided on it at a whim. As for order embodiment, it was disciplined, boring, cold, calculating. Nothing could pursue her to hand over control. Eris would rather keep her balanced personality and free will than go for this risky level up unless she was left with no other choice. Since her battle with Felix was more of a test than a battle of life and death, she had no reason to go for it. Well, I hope this is enough to win you over. Felix's gaze turned solemn, now. Can you tell me the whole truth? At the moment, Felix couldn't care less about Eris' defeat, her core, or even the stone of reality. All he wanted to know was the reality of his identity. As I uttered before, it's not the truth, it's a theory. Eris shared calmly, the only method to truly confirm it is through interacting the stone of reality. 1797 The Birth of the Universe I Touch the stone of reality Felix frowned. He wasn't thrilled by the thought of getting close to that abnormality, his reaction was valid when Lilith had failed to touch it while Uranus almost died from it. Although it looked like the stone of reality was weirdly responsive and obedient to him, it still didn't lower his vigilance. I know you have some misgivings about its dangers. Eris shared calmly, but, it's truly the only way to confirm my theory. Don't worry. I am quite positive nothing bad will happen to you. How about you tell me about your theory first? Felix's eyelids twitched, then, I will consider if it is worth it to risk my life for it. I do you one better. Eris pierced through her chest with an arm and pulled out her unigen core from it. It was quite peculiar as half of it was covered in chaotic colors while the other half had orderly lines and symbols written on it. Under Felix's and the tenant's surprised looks, she sent the core towards Felix, allowing him to hold it in his palms. You can absorb my core as promised, Eris said calmly, in this way if something bad were to happen, both of us would suffer the consequence. This. Felix was left holding the core speechlessly. Everyone knew that Eris planned on handing over her core if she were defeated, 
but to see her doing it for real without a change of expression was a different story. Are you truly sure about this? Felix couldn't help but double down on her maddening choice. Certainties are for the weak-minded and cowards. Eris stated indifferently, I walk on the path of truth, filled with cliffs gazing at the abyss. Without taking leaps of faith, I wouldn't have come this far. Upon hearing this, everyone's expressions displayed varying degrees of respect and amazement at Eris's approach to life. She made it clear that no matter what the final outcome, as long as she was on the path of truth, she would have no regrets. Now, are you going to touch it or not? Eris removed the dimensional prison and said, Weren't you intending to obtain it in the first place? How were you planning to do it originally? I don't know. Felix rubbed his chin embarrassedly, I left it for my future self to handle after I take care of you and Uranus. It was expected since he truly had no information about the Stone of Reality besides the things Lilith had told him. Although he knew that the Upper Celestials had failed to retrieve it, this didn't make him give up on the thought straight away. After all, it never hurt to try. You can stop thinking too much about it. Eris shared, there was nothing I haven't tried with the Upper Celestials, and yet, here we are. I see. Felix contemplated it for a few moments before deciding to do what she said. He realized that not many options were available even if he decided to play it slow. Thus, he might as well test her theory. Of course, he had no intention of touching it with his main consciousness. He manifested a perfect clone through his Rathsin and sent it toward the Stone of Reality. Make sure to navigate through the miasma. Eris advised as she joined the central table with the rest of the tenants. She fit in so well that no one realized she was sitting with them until she opened her mouth. I am trying, but there is just so much the deeper I go. Felix frowned. Uranus almost got killed because of it. Eris shared, the closer you are to the stone, the more potent it is. When he was merely a few steps away from the heart, a single drop landed on his arm and changed its properties instantly. If it wasn't for Ares' quick reflex, slicing Uranus' arm apart, he would have been sent to the universe's heart. So, that's what happened to him. Felix raised an eyebrow, no wonder he is terrified of the first floor. But wait, can the stone of reality really affect Unigen cores? Thor knitted his eyebrows in bafflement. Its authority is matching with the universe when it's dormant. What do you think? Eris responded calmly. How bizarre. Felix asked with a serious tone, why do you think that is? We have witnessed it fight against the universe when I made a wish. It lost, but still, it did put up a decent fight. I expected as much. Eris wasn't surprised, if my theory is correct, you will find out when you touch it. So, just focus on that. Say less. Felix narrowed his eyes in concentration as he glided past the spreading miasma. When he started going through more concentrated areas, where it was nearly impossible to move without being touched, he started using his abilities. The miasma mist couldn't be affected negatively by any elemental ability, such as getting pulled or pushed away. That's why the all-devouring puppet hadn't been able to absorb it too. However, it consumed itself the moment it touched an object or interacted with some type of energy. Thus, Felix kept feeding it with abilities from multiple energies, causing it to get consumed bit by bit until his path was cleared. He kept doing this for a couple of minutes, taking it as slow as possible. When he finally arrived at the Stone of Reality, he summoned a protective barrier. The barrier sprang to life around him akin to a translucent cocoon. It was not merely a shield but a dynamic entity that interacted with the miasma by feeding it continuously. This should do the trick. Confident in his protection, Felix turned his focus to the stone of reality, gazing at its deep crevices, and flesh-like veins running across its surface. Here we go. A bit hesitant, Felix extended his hand towards it, his fingers brushing against its cool and smooth surface. The moment contact was made, the stone of reality thumped out loud simultaneously with Felix's heart. Ka-thumb. Ka-thumb. 
It's just like the first time you stepped inside the floor. Elder Crocken raised an eyebrow in surprise, do you really have a connection to it? Felix wasn't able to answer as the instant he touched the stone of reality, his consciousness was drawn in instantly. When he opened his eyes, he found himself floating on an empty inky canvas with nothing in sight besides a tiny bright dot in the distance. Where am I? Felix knitted his eyebrows in confusion. This is the instant everything begins. Lilith responded with a faint smile, make sure to watch closely. Wait! Is this before the birth of the universe? Felix and the tenants were left stunned at the notion of viewing the birth of the universe with their own eyes. Does that mean that little bright dot is the central singularity? Lord Loki commentated as he gazed at the bright small sphere. You call it central singularity in modern science, but in reality, it is the universe's heart. Eris shared calmly. You kidding right? It can't be. If it's the universe's heart, how can it exist after the initial Big Bang? The tenants found it difficult to believe. They knew that the universe's birth came from the Big Bang, causing agitating gases and matter, elementary particles that would shape the building blocks of stars, galaxies, and planets, to erupt into existence. I never shared that didn't happen. Eris persisted calmly, the universe did come from an explosion of dense heated energy. But, have you ever wondered what was that energy? The instant she phrased it like this, it clicked in everyone's minds at once, making them blurt it out loud. Celestial Energy 1798 The Birth of the Universe 2. Eris neither confirmed nor denied it. She pointed at the universe's heart and said, watch, and you will understand. Felix went closer to the universe's heart and saw that it was getting smaller and denser, seemingly attempting to reach a point of no return, a point of singularity in this infinite expanse of nothingness. Then, without any warning, the singularity erupted. A blinding flash tore through the fabric of the nascent cosmos as massive quantities of celestial energy were expelled in all directions. Felix and the rest covered their faces reflexively but realized that the light was harmless and they could still see through it. Thus, with odd and disbelieving looks, they gazed at the explosion of creation, playing the very first notes of reality's grand score. How magnificent! Not in my wildest dreams did I think I would witness the birth of the universe. Look at it go! Each tenant had a different reaction to the incredible sight, but all of them shared an odd expression. Meanwhile, Felix touched the expanding milky-thick white celestial energy, coursing his hands gently through it. He felt like he was moving it through thick hot jelly, making his heart accelerate in exhilaration. This much celestial energy, holy, the things I can do with it. Felix was still struggling to even obtain bits of celestial energy in its gas state. Even the three rulers barely had enough to create a sphere of condensed gooey celestial energy. To see this much get expelled into the infinite expanse at the speed of light made it hard for Felix not to get greedy for some. Soon, time started accelerating immensely, causing eons to pass by in mere moments. Felix and the rest observed how the celestial energy cooled and coalesced, stretching across the expanding universe. But nothing happened next, the celestial energy continued expanding everywhere, but did not turn into anything. This surprised Felix and the tenants. Hmm? I thought laws were supposed to appear by now. Where are the subatomics, atoms, matter? Candace tilted her head in confusion, her reaction shared by the rest. If my theory is correct, then we are about to witness the birth of that exact process. Eris replied with a focused gaze at the universe's heart. When they heard this, they realized that even Eris was ignorant about the full truth of the universe's birth. Thus, no one bothered her with questions and affixed their eyes on the universe's heart, gazing at it with great curiosity and a bit of nervous excitement. Ka thumb. Suddenly, the now enlarged universe's heart made a thumping noise within the infinite pool of white celestial energy. Before anyone could react, the universe's heart began to fluctuate with an intensity that none had ever witnessed. Then, a vortex of pure celestial energy emerged around it, drawing in massive quantities of the released celestial energy. 
It kept pulling and increasingly until a tall featureless humanoid being was formed amidst the storm. Felix and the tenant's eyes widened to limit in shock, their heartbeats accelerating in agitation and fear at the freaky sight before them. Yet, the scariest and freakiest part had yet to come. With the birth of the form and the universe's heart at its center, six more hearts formed around it. Each heart was distinct, uniquely shaped, and throbbing with its own rhythm, yet harmoniously aligned with the beats of the universe's heart. Felix and the tenants instantly recognized two hearts, a white spherical core and a heart in the shape of a white stone. Is that a snus core and the stone of reality? Thor murmured, days plastered all over his face. They are. With a faint relieved smile, Eris approved, it seems my theory was correct after all. How can this be? Felix was left stunned, having no idea how to react. What about those other hearts? And is this the universe's consciousness? Lord Loki inquired with a solemn tone, his usual playfulness was nowhere to be seen. It's not the universe's consciousness, it's him. Eris said as she pointed at Felix, making him shudder all of a sudden. Just as Felix opened his mouth, wanting to deny it, Eris carried on calmly, now, I can share with you my theory. After putting my focus on little Paragon's journey, I understood that many things came up in his path for a reason. They weren't coincidences, but opportunities planted in his path. When Asna was added to the picture, plus his perfect synchronization with her soul, his ability to use her core, integrating with Kraken's bloodline for his internal mutation, obtaining the sealing hall to capture Lilith's clone, and the list goes on. Even the birth of the primogenitors was planned not as an entertainment. It was a mere small part of it. The three rulers went for it because the tablet told them to do so. It never shared the reason or its purpose, but now I am certain it was to set up the stage for little Paragon's journey. Without the primogenitors, even if he possessed a Sna's core, he can do nothing with it in his infancy mortal stage. The primogenitor's birth was a must to share their elemental control at a much wider rate, allowing for even humans to use their powers through integrating with beasts. In his case, he went straight for the source, allowing him to obtain the only mutation that mattered in the grand scheme of things. Kraken's internal mutation that allowed him to host seven hearts simultaneously. The more Eris spoke, the clearer a picture was painted in the primogenitor's minds, making them realize that this made more sense than being born for the sake of entertainment. How could the three rulers waste celestial energy, their powers and their efforts to create them just for entertainment? Their entire goal was the other side and they would do everything to make it happen. It made absolutely no sense to deviate from their goal for some entertainment. It became clear to me that he was being guided to become something unique, something only he could be. Eris paused as she gazed at Felix's narrowed pupils, it's none other than the rebirth of the universe's consciousness. Felix and the tenants remained silent, but the look in their eyes betrayed their true emotions, already predicting where she was going. Before the shock of finding out about their true purpose was absorbed, Eris pointed her finger at the humanoid entity and hit them with another bombshell, now, to the core of my theory. It's highly believed that the cosmos is built on five pillars. Three celestial languages, the laws, and the elements. This was the accepted and most logical consensus. Eris shook her finger, but now, I am certain it's built on seven pillars and you are gazing at them right this instant. When she said this, everyone's eyes focused on the seven hearts within the entity, knowing that she was addressing them. There is a Sna's heart, symbolizing the laws of the universe. There are also the cores of the three rulers which represent the three celestial languages enabling communication with these laws elements Additionally, there is the heart of reality, which I believe contributed to shaping the universe's reality and unifying these laws to create a logical reality. As for the heart of the universe, it was the central piece that gave birth to them and bound them together. It can be said to be the main heart, the ringleader. Eris added unbothered by the stupefied looks she was receiving, that's why the cosmos managed to win against the stone of reality during your wish in the void. It was the universe's heart deciding while the secondary heart was fighting off its authority, but failing to do so. 
It all makes sense now, I see it, I truly see your brilliance. Lady Sphinx commentated with an appreciative tone after her mind eventually connected all the dots and understood the genius of Eris to figure out the truth on her own. Also, why she believed Felix to be the universe's consciousness. But, not everyone was as quick-witted as her. What about the seventh heart? You mentioned only six. Candace addressed the obvious with a confused tone. Isn't apparent by now. Eris remarked with a faint smile as she eyed Felix's chest. It's my human heart. Felix murmured under his breath while touching his chest. Wait. How? How is that even possible? Lord Loki exclaimed in shock. It really doesn't make much sense. Thor frowned, how can what we are seeing now is Felix's human heart? His current human heart state isn't the same as the one in the scene. Eris nodded in approval for a moment before adding, however, the only pillar left untouched is the pillar of elements and elemental energy. Tell me, is there any race in the cosmos with the possibility to unlock affinities with all elements in the universe and control them besides humans? Of course, you may say that any human can do the same and I would agree, but, Eris pointed at Felix and said, he is different, he is the chosen one. He is the only one with the potential to reach the state where he can advance his human heart into its celestial counterpart and turn it into the seventh piece. How will he do it? I have some theories, but I am not sure yet. However, I am more than certain that my hypothesis is correct and that the little paragon was born to walk on this path of rebirth, a path only he can walk on, a path, where the end is to become the universe's consciousness and regain its owner. The greatest evidence is right in front of your eyes, Eris concluded as she manifested a spiritual image of Felix's internal heart system and their placements. This. When the tenants gazed at it, chills coursed down their spines after seeing that it perfectly matched with the internal system of the featureless being before them. 1799 The Birth of the Universe 3. The chilling evidence was right there before their eyes, they could deny it all they wanted but nothing would change. The internal systems were perfectly accurate with each other. Since Felix was the only entity in the entire universe with the humanoid version of the Kraken's internal system, it removed any possibility of it being a coincidence. This was it. This was the truth. The undeniable truth. Felix's knees suddenly buckled as he felt the universe's weight fall on his shoulders, grappled by the implications of such truth. All this time, I have been the universe? Are you screwing with me? Is this some unholy joke I don't understand? Me the universe's consciousness? What does that make us now? The three rulers? The primogenitors? The unigens? Is everyone just a small piece of me? The more Felix thought about it, the harder it got for him to accept. As much as the tenants were shocked, None could truly comprehend what Felix was going through. To find yourself to be the origin of all creation and destruction, life and death, was enough to break anyone's mind apart. The worst part? This revelation made him question if he was the progenitor of the trauma going on in his life for the sake of restoring his powers and authority. Did he create the prophecy tablet that led the three rulers to assist him on a path to rebirth? If so, didn't that indicate he actively made Asna's life hell, forcing her to be born and imprisoned at a young age? The ceiling hall that was given to me by Lord Zervan, it was in a spatial ear ring with my soul's mark, yet it was given to him millions of years before I was born. Did I arrange for someone to hand it to him? Felix murmured with a soulless look, all the unexplainable mysteries were starting to make sense. It was created based on the tablet's instructions and if I am its creator, doesn't that mean I actively participated in Asna's imprisonment for my selfish motives? Also, if Asna is born out of one of my hearts just like the three rulers, did I fall in love with a piece of myself? No, 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 no. The more Felix thought about it, the faster his reality crumbled, making him feel sicker and sicker in his stomach, everything was so f asteriskied up, that he had no idea what to think, to feel, and how to behave. I know it's tough, but don't take it the wrong way. Lady Sphinx remarked with a comforting tone, 
you might have the potential to become the universe's embodiment, but at the moment, you are a human, a unigen, a person with an identity just like anyone else. You are Felix Maxwell and none of this change it. She added solemnly, as for the rest? None of it is confirmed as we still have no clue what happened to this featureless entity. She is right. Thor jumped in, for all we know, it could be someone else working in the shadows to restore the universe's consciousness. After all, why were the universe's seven hearts divided, with some gaining consciousness while others did not? It's too early to start making such a heavy speculation. Fenrir supported with a cold expression, the universe's consciousness possessed absolute omnipotence. I can't see a way for it to go through this trouble for the sake of a rebirth when there is nothing strong enough to kill it in the first place within its territory. Indeed, I am starting to feel that the Unigen's theory of an outer god causing trouble is making more sense. Lord Loki nodded strongly, think about it. What if the universe was invaded at its early creation stage and its consciousness fought hard to rebel against it, causing its hearts to separate and even wounded like the stone of reality? After the invasion failed, the universe consciousness closed our universe and went absent once and for all. Isn't this the same thing they said? Lord Shiva frowned, where are you going with this? I am getting to it. Lord Loki leaned closer and suggested with a serious tone, what if, I am saying what if the outer gods realized that the only way to open up our universe is through bringing back its consciousness to life? They were the ones who created the prophecy tablet and allured the three rulers to follow its instructions to achieve their dream of reaching the other side. But in reality, they would be doing nothing but opening the gates of hell on us. When Felix heard this, life was restored in his eyes. It does make more sense, the universe's consciousness won't go through all of this trouble for no apparent reason. He remarked, his voice picking up some soul in it. The shock of being the consciousness of the universe was nowhere as damaging as being the one responsible for the trauma of his loved ones. If it was true, then his entire life was nothing but a planned conspiracy orchestrated by himself. Everyone suddenly turned to Eris seeking approval for their theory, but all they got was a shrug of a shoulder. I won't lie to you, I have no idea if there was an outsider interference or not. All I know is that something drastic must have happened before the birth of the three rulers. This is the truth that I am seeking. Eris narrowed her eyes, why did the universe lose its consciousness? Why is it attempting its rebirth? Who is behind the tablet? What's on the other side? Those are the questions brewing in my mind and there is only one way to truly figure them out. What way is th? Before Thor could finish his question, Everyone's attention was suddenly drawn to the shapeless cosmic being. Asna's heart surfaced outside of the being's chest and started to meticulously sort and refine the celestial energy released across the entire universe. It transformed into distinct subatomic particles, atoms, electrons, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, gravity, electromagnetism, and strong and weak nuclear forces, etc. From those subatomic materials and principles, it created the laws as we know it. Following closely, the heart of reality surfaced with a singular purpose. Gathering those nascent laws and crafting them into a coherent, logical system. This heart was the architect, building the structure upon which all other things would rely. It laid down the laws of thermodynamics, ensuring energy conservation and entropy, it defined the laws of motion and made all the laws in the universe coexist in a balanced state. This caused the celestial bodies to enter their eternal dance across the cosmos. Felix and the others watched all of this happen right before their own eyes. Before they could discuss it, the heart of elements made its move after the framework of laws was established. It breathed life into the laws by formulating a mirroring set of elements. In addition, it filled the universe with neutral energy, making it possible to be converted into elemental energy. This energy became the foundation for the universe's life forms since celestial energy was a potent but fleeting type of energy compared to the sustainability of elemental energy. Once the physical and legal architectures were in place, the three celestial hearts, universal, divine, and runic codex made their move. They acted as the scribes of the universe, 
each one inscribing one of the three universal languages onto the fabric of the laws and elements. These languages allow beings across the cosmos to interact with, understand, and manipulate the fundamental energies and laws with three different methods. Without them, not a single entity besides the unigens, three rulers, and the elementals could control the laws slash elements in the universe. Their existence was in a sense less important than the other cores since the universe would continue operating as normal without them. However, it would not have the same vigorous life in it. After the seven hearts finished their work, a coherent universe was born from nothing but celestial energy. A universe built on seven pillars, making it a masterpiece of order and functionality, a realm where every particle and every force was interconnected. Felix and the tenants felt a deep connection to the cosmos after witnessing how its birth process happened, finally completing the puzzle. How marvelous, after celestial energy was transformed into the universe we know it today, it was exhausted almost entirely. Hormongondra admired after noticing that the only leftover celestial energy was encompassed around the featureless being. It was like everything was calculated to the last letter. It's truly crafted by a mastermind. It's simply impossible for such perfect creation to have no creator. Thor remarked, his gaze focused on the entity before him. Just as the rest were about to join the discussion, Felix's vision started to turn darker and darker. This made him understand that the stone of reality was kicking him out of its memories. Knowing that he might not return here again, Felix tried to catch one last glimpse of the shapeless being. When his gaze landed on him, Felix suddenly felt chills course down his spine after seeing a tiny line emerge on the lower half of the shapeless being. A curved line in the shape of a smile. While it had no eyes, Felix felt, no, he was certain that entity was gazing straight into his soul, making him feel a special type of connection he had only with Isna. Is that really me? This was the last thought coursing down his mind as he got kicked out back to the first floor. 1800 The Guardian of Infinity and Finality The moment Felix opened his eyes, he was shocked to find that the stone of reality was nowhere to be seen, even the miasma was gone. The only thing left behind was the celestial abnormalities spread out across the entire floor, seemingly unaffected by the disappearance of the heart. Before the tenants could react to this scene, Felix felt a chill course down his spine after finding out that one of his dormant hearts was completely replaced with the stone of reality. It even turned into a heart made out of flesh with veins and blood coursing through it like it was always there. The most shocking part? This happened to his main body instead of the clone touching the stone of reality. This. I guess there are no more questions about your identity. Eris said with a faint chuckle. I guess not. Felix rubbed his eyelids with a bitter smile as he sat down on a piece of cracked ground. He lifted his head and gazed at the stone of reality's original position, not bothering to even question how it happened. What else was there to question? The stone of reality had rejected all the upper celestials from touching it. Meanwhile, it became an integral part of Felix without his consent, integrating with him so seamlessly that he felt nothing when it happened. Little one, mind telling me how did you capture the stone of reality? Suddenly, Felix's guard peaked to the limit after his ears picked up on an unfamiliar friendly voice, echoing across the first floor. In less than a nanosecond, Felix extended his senses to the limit, his eyes sweeping across every object and entity until they landed on a massive white tree. It was standing against the distorted sky, its roots stretching upwards while its branches burrowed into the ground, a clear defiance of nature's order. Yet, Felix's eyes were affixed on a single being, who was leaning casually against this reversed tree. With a wheat straw between his lips, he seemed utterly at ease, one leg crossed over the other his arms folded as he observed Felix with curious eyes. Aries. Felix uttered with a hardened expression while entering a battle stance, preparing for a real death match. Unlike Aries, he never had any interactions with Aries before, and from everything he heard about him, he wasn't to be f asteriskied with whether prepared or unprepared. How the f asterisk ck did he get in here? I thought it was impossible to enter the tower when the entrance was closed. Thor exclaimed in shock and dread. 
This question coursed through everyone's minds and made them feel chills course down their spine at the thought of Ares managing to enter the first floor without Felix picking up on him. He even left his main consciousness on guard duty in case something happened to his clone. From the expression on your face, it appears that you are puzzled by my method of entry. How about this? I will explain my approach, and you can share how you captured the heart. Ares spoke casually like he was talking to a good friend of him. Felix, I want you to listen to me closely. Put my core in a SNES core and permit me to continue using my powers. Then, find a way to escape using the stone of reality. Ares' entire changed to a cold one, I will slow him down. The tenants were left utterly stunned, not expecting in the slightest for the powerful and fearless Ares to make such requests. She was literally asking Felix to run away even when he had just shown her what he could do in his true embodiment state. Her reaction shocked even Felix, leaving him with mixed emotions. He didn't know if he should be angry at her for underestimating his strength after everything he had shown or if he should be heavily concerned about his safety. After all, there was no way Eris would react like this unless for a good reason. I suggest you listen to her. Lilith supported with a sober tone, you are not ready yet to deal with him. When even Lilith backed her up, it made the tenant's heart skip a beat, realizing that maybe, just maybe, Ares was on a whole different spectrum than the rest of the Unigens. I will do it, but not before I get my answers. Felix put his wisp on the job and refocused back on Ares. How about an introduction first? Felix narrowed his eyes. Ah, how impolite of me. Ares removed the wheat blade from his mouth and introduced himself, Ares, the guardian of beginning and end, of life and death, and finality and infinity. He hadn't said much, but at the same time, he said a lot. Life and death. I thought he only commanded the laws of finality and infinity. Candace was stunned. All of them were already informed about Ares' laws being infinity and finality, it wasn't really a big secret. However, they weren't told about his exact powers and what these laws implied. Think about it. The laws of infinity and finality are not merely guidelines to the universe's workings. They are the very embodiment of its most primal forces, life and death. To comprehend them is to grasp the clever paradox at the heart of existence. Infinite cycles, infinite outcomes, infinite beginnings, and ends, Eris continued for her, consider a star in the void. It births from dust and gas, living in burning glory, and then dies in a spectacular blaze, only to return to the cosmos as dust once more. This cycle observed on a cosmic scale, reflects the infinite nature of life and death themselves. Since the universe laws are mostly based on stars and other celestial objects, then, it based death and life laws as part of the infinity laws instead of being independent. Just like sound is part of vibrations and charm is part of lust laws. In other words, Ares wasn't just the guardian of infinity and finality. He was the guardian of life and death as well. Ares narrowed her eyes coldly, making him, the most powerful and dangerous Unigen in the universe. Upon hearing this, Candace couldn't help but draw in a cold breath in dread, gazing at Ares akin to staring at the Grim Reaper himself. She now understood that Ares had the power to end the life of any Unigen he desired with a snap of a finger. All it took appeared a command to end their life cycle and it would be over for them. Naturally, it would be through abusing his laws. But still, because the infinity and finality laws represent the very birth and end of the universe itself, they possess massive authority over the rest of the laws. The fact Eris was fearful of Ares implied his laws superseded hers, making them the most authoritative set of laws in the universe. Felix had listened to all of this and still, had no intentions of running away without getting to understand Ares' motives. He knew that for a being like him, it was near impossible for the three rulers to have any control over him, unlike Uranus. Felix Maxwell, a mortal, a primogenitor, a unigen, and now, on the path to become a unigen overlord. Felix introduced calmly, without a hint of intimidation in his face. Unigen overlord. Ares rubbed his chin in intrigue, after watching your journey in the quantum realm, 
I have to admit, I can see you pulling it off. You were watching me? How? Felix narrowed his eyes dangerously, feeling like his privacy appeared invaded. There was nothing he hated more than being spied on while having no clue about it. Well, of course, I appeared sent on a mission to bring you back with Little Asna's core. Ares replied in a relaxed state, as for the how? Isn't it obvious? Before Felix could think too much about it, Ares answered the question on his own, all existence is part of the Sassra cycle. As the ruler of this cycle, I can see all, hear all, and feel all through anyone, everyone, and anything I choose. Whether one appeared alive or as a spirit, a mortal or a unigen, everyone is part me. You can come up with your own explanation on how that helped me enter the first floor. Ares finished with a faint smile, I hope that clarifies your doubts. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, his expression suddenly turned rigid, how did you make the stone of reality submit to you?